So we're, we're going live. Uh, we are now live. And when I transition to all of you being able to see us, uh, Brian and Daguerre are going to be, what's the, is this downward? No, that's not, what's this pose? That's Artichandra, not half moon pose. The pose. Okay. Who wants to see Brian in this pose to kick things <laughs> off? All right. Ready? Wait, one, two, boom. <laughs> Rachel, that what, it? what's your, do you, do you have any construct? No, 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 you got to put your hand down. You're uh, oh, uh, uh, I ain't going that far down. I would take the and I would take half moon pose. Yeah, you really want to stack that one hip on top of the other and imagine that your whole body is flush with the wall behind you. So you're making one linear plane. I think that might come with some practice. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Fred, uh, on the spot, though, at least I got my leg up. That's what I was proud of. <laughs> Forward yeah. progress. Brian, <laughs> Brian, you you yeah. look like a nimble, flexible specimen of, of <laughs> yoga uh, <laughs> mastery. Oh, my God. And look who joined us. Mr. Morris. Good morning, it's, it's, sir. It's our, it's our technically challenged member. <laughs> no, it's not me. <laughs> I got bolted by lightning. I got an excuse, man. Anytime I touch fucking electronics, it goes wrong. <laughs> cool. It's we'll nice get more to into see you. See you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to be back. I'm going to try to get on to the computer if it'll allow me. But for right now, we'll just go with the phone. Right on. Well, Rachel is going to kick off um, like mantras, right? And some breath work. Am I saying that right? Yeah, so I was going to just offer a moment of mindfulness and meditation before we begin. And so usually what I do when we're working with the plant spirit medicine is we first attune ourselves to be able to connect with the plant. Just like if you see a plant as a sentient being, it's almost as if we're building a relationship with that plant. And so we want to make sure that we can show up as our most balanced and aligned selves. And so whenever I'm working with the plants or the soil in any capacity or the worms, uh, I, I always wanna make sure that I have these tools with me. So everything from uh, meditation, the way in which we control our thoughts to asana, as Brian was just demonstrating, the way in which we hold our body um, to our breath or pranayam. So the way in which we move this breath, this divine life force through us. and so. We see this mirrored um, in the soil below us and in the cosmos above. And so we're really this divine channel uh, that can access this wisdom from as above, so below. Um, so and that some of that comes from the Emerald Tablet, is that correct? The as above, so below, as within, so without? Um, yes, I believe so. You know, I think it's echoed in, in many different cultures of understanding ourselves by looking both up and looking down. Right. Well. Yeah, so I'll invite everyone to let your lips close, uh, find a nice comfortable seat, whether you're sitting or standing, or even if you want to lay down, and just begin to notice the breath. So notice it without judgment or without trying to change or manipulate your breath but just start to increase that awareness and that consciousness of this breath that is moving through you. Notice where it is in your body. Notice how it feels, the quality. Is there a temperature? Is there a rhythm to it? And so as you start to notice the breath, I'll invite you to bring your hands to your belly. So our navel or our belly button is every single one of us our first source to life through the umbilical cord. And so the navel is what both initiates the inhalation and the exhalation. But most of us are running around with short, shallow breaths in the chest and not connecting to our divine source. And so when we consciously bring the breath into the belly, into the low pelvic bowl, we can start to access this ancient wisdom. And so with the hands on the belly, I find it's a, a great and simple guide to remind us to bring the breath there. So as you inhale, see if you can let the belly inflate like a balloon, bringing the breath down deep and low. And you can see my fingers are starting to separate. I'm really filling up that pelvic bowl with my breath. And then pause here, hold that. So as you inhale, the belly fills, the chest lifts, the collarbones expand. 
And then when you exhale, it begins also at the navel center. So now I'm gonna draw my belly button back towards my spine and you'll see now my fingers are starting to cross. So that navel is that divine force that can move the breath upon through us. So inhaling, breathing into your wholeness, into your fullness, pause. And then also out through the nose, simply and slowly exhale. Let the navel draw all the way back behind your rib cage. Good, now just keep this breathing pattern as you inhale. Be mindful to rest the shoulders away from the ears. Feel the crown of your head lift and fall. Feel your tailbone rooted. Now pause for a count of four. Three, two, one. And exhale, slowly release. Feel yourself grounding into the earth. And now pause for a count of four. Three, two, one. Inhale. Hold in. And peacefully exhale. And hold. And now when you're ready, taking your next inhale and just let your breath start to sort of flow naturally in and out through the body in a peaceful manner. And so what we're really essentially doing here is starting to train our nervous system. So we're either living in a sympathetic or parasympathetic, um, the first being a sort of fight or flight and the other being where we can rest and digest and communicate and work with the plant medicine. So as you let your breath come back to its neutral state, I'm going to offer a sound for your mind to focus on. So our minds are often speaking to us so wildly. And so in Sanskrit, we call that chitta or the chatter that's constantly going on in the back of our head. And you'll most often find that that chitta is uh, the way that we speak to ourselves is far worse than any way we might speak to anybody else. And so I invite you to just let that even quiet and move by like clouds on a sunny day. And just let your awareness and your attention come back to the breath and now to the sounds that you hear. And now notice what you notice, any differences or changes since we all first met and came together. And seeing that you yourself are the creator of any changes that you have experienced here in this short time together. And so I'm going to open the space for this divine communication with all of the plants that have taken their time to alchemize and photosynthesize the sun, whether from the sun in the sky or the photons and the lights, um, moving that through their photosynthesis in their leaves out for us to ultimately use as a medicine. And so I'll offer these blessings to you all, cleansing us, opening our awareness, so we may gather together as a community today. Aho, namaste. That was awesome. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, we should open more often like this. I find it's a nice way to create a sacred space um, anytime working with the plants. It's such 
a, a great way to create a uh, your set and setting is really important. I'm sure, especially as you start to work with all different types of plants and to psychedelic plants, um, the set and setting can become so important. It's all about intention, right? Absolutely. Peter, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we, I think we were all muted. There we go. There we go. So I want to get into more. Uh, we appreciate starting off, to be honest with you. Uh, I feel kind of high from doing that, like uh, the deeper breath work. I feel like I was taking in some oxygen. Is that kind of the, the goal of that is to really just get the lungs going, get the body in motion, especially if you started doing that, you know, like as you woke up first thing or before you go to well, bed? Absolutely. The breath is more powerful than beyond measure. It can do everything from change your DNA and your cellular structure to the endocrine system, um, you know, to what hormones our body is producing. Um, everything from releasing the production of cortisol, which is our stress hormone, to helping promote more endorphins. And so uh, it's so little time that us as humans take even just stop and pause and think about the breath, even if it's for you know, 60 seconds in the morning, just taking three deep breaths to center yourself before you start your day. Um, and it's, it's interesting you said that you feel high because the ultimate goal of these practices is so that, um, you know, the, the holy sages, they just say they sort of uh, are alive through their divine connection to nature. And so getting to a point where, you know, you don't need any herbs at all to get high because you already are so connected to your source consciousness that you can access it through the breath. Um, and it, it's interesting too, because the breath is what connects us to a lot of these plant medicines like cannabis that we'll talk about today and um, all of the different elements. And so we'll still see that, you know, that the ancient science of yoga comes from Ayurveda, which means the science of life. And uh, some say that uh, all the plants were on this planet for thousands of years before us. And it was when we worked with these plants that we were awakened to their wisdom. So how to breathe. I don't know if you remember the first time you ever got high or smoked weed, but um, perhaps you or, or some people I hear, you know, eat a weed brownie and they're like, I can't breathe anymore. I forget how to breathe um, it, because it, we're going into this divine state almost. Um, or if you smoked for, you know, if you got really high and you felt yourself just want to stretch and open up or twist, um, it's that plant wisdom speaking and working through you. So the breath can really be that tool of consciousness. Well said. And I really feel like uh, when you're taking it to that level and you're getting yourself um, accumulate, accumulated for the, the morning and, and kind of setting your intention for the day, um, I've personally noticed that, and we've talked about this a couple of times on the show, how it seems like the metaphysical world sometimes seems to open up when the entire team that's working on the, on the grow um, is all feeling good and one, we all believe in one another, where if there's inner fighting uh, between the team, but you really notice the plants, um, especially the larger the facility, the more um, effect I've seen to notice uh, when the team is, you know, has some issues. Uh, is there any way you could speak on that a little bit? Have you experienced any of that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, on every level from the physical to the metaphysical, when you have a stable ecosystem, it's going to be working in balance, right? So we know that if you create any form of instability, it'll become out of balance. That's how we get things like pests in our gardens. It's from an unstable ecosystem. And so the same with the ecosystem of your team uh, that you have working on cultivation, everything from the nursery to cultivation to harvest, ensuring that everyone's on the same page and uh, also in a form of um, reciprocity. And so that's where everyone's feeling like it's a co-creation and having a sense of uh, ownership in that greater web of life, right? Because we're all part of the whole. And so when we can walk through life in that way, our plants will understand. And so the plants really are mirroring us. Um, there was one of my great plant teachers. She, she said, you know, she didn't even water her plants so much, but they were vibrant and alive just because her energy and her body 
um, with bringing them so much vibrancy. And I know that there's been a lot of research done in regards to uh, what's that book, What a Plant Knows, everything from the music that you can play to a plant and how it might respond um, to your actual energy. So if you think about the way in which we speak or our tone of voice, um, there's something called the vagus nerve that runs throughout our body. And so the vagus nerve, what we've seen through research is that the higher vagal tone you have, the more well-liked you are. And so how do you get a, a higher vagal tone? That's through doing things like meditation and yoga and the foods that we eat can affect our vagal tone. And so that's creating the types of relationships with our employees and also with our plants ultimately. Right on. Uh, this I knew this was going to be fun today because uh, Rachel and I have worked on a few projects in the past. Um, and I don't feel like uh, as many viewers know there's how uh, depth your knowledge is just um, beyond cannabis. Uh, so it's exciting to be able to talk to a variety of topics with you today. Uh, but a lot of the uh, Instagram folk want to know uh, how you are cultivating the methods that you're using, what amendments you're using, kind of the typical questions you're asked. Uh, a lot of people just kind of want to know what you're using to, um, to, to build your soils. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, when we think about building soil, uh, we focus on those essential building blocks of having a type of organic matter and what are the minerals that we're putting into it and then what are the microbes, right? And so they all come together uh, in a certain way. And so what I've been focusing on is what we call indoor no-till cultivation. And so creating um, one of my first indoor bins was actually in a bin like this and then moving um, those outside as well, but creating systems of perpetuation. And so we're really modeling mother nature, right? There is no endpoints in nature. And so as humans, what we've done <clears throat> with the industrial agricultural revolutions is try to create endpoints um, through things like capitalism, where we need to have endpoints. Um, <clears throat> So in the indoor no-till cultivation, one of the things I was going to talk about today, I have my worm bin here. I find that uh, having a worm, uh, worms or a verma, vermicomposting system can be very advantageous in closing all the loops within your garden. So whether you're doing outdoor cultivation or indoor cultivation, um, having a animal in there I found can be a very advantageous so everything from the microorganisms that we work with to the macroorganisms and so one of one of the greatest quotes I love from permaculture that Bill Mollison says um, for for outdoor crops of course is that uh, one of the farmers had snails that were eating all of their plants and he said uh, you don't have a snail problem you have a duck deficiency and so when we're thinking about these closed loop systems and how do we create a stable ecosystem, whether it's inside or outside, um, what can we introduce or connect into those systems? And so the worms are one thing that I love to use in cultivation. And so what that looks like is um, every single indoor uh, no-till pot or even you create those beds where you're creating a sea of green inside. Um, has the worms in there. And so they help with decomposition. Um, they're, they help with binding soil particles together. Uh, and I, I always say there's no such thing as no till because if you have a worm in there, it's tilling a little bit and creating those waterways and those uh, airways for oxygen and water and nutrients to cycle and move through. So I like to call it low till. <laughs> <clears throat> But I do have my worms today. I was going to show you all. So I just did a feeding last night. And um, in your worm bin, they prefer to have about 50% green foods and about 50% brown. So here's one of them today. And this is all of their excretions or as what we call vermicompost and so you can top dress your beds with the vermicompost <coughs> when I mix soil I'll use about 50 percent sorry I'm having smoke in me um 
50% vermicompost in my compost mix. <clears throat> um, yeah. So when you're starting to build your soils, um, are you focusing on different composting worms? Or are you just focused on the red wigglers? Uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of using four different worms, but I know you and I have had discussions where you've seen uh, worms that actually eat one another. I've personally never seen that. So I was wondering if um, you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so right now I just am running the red wigglers. I like to try to keep it simple as possible. And um, as, as Fukuoka says, uh, the do nothing farming. So try to keep it simple. Um, so right now I'm just using the red wiggler worms, but I have experimented in the past with the African blue worms. And I know that they like to dig a lot deeper. And so if you're using a no-till system, um, sometimes what I found was that they were almost competing with each other in the same system. So I've just stuck with the red wigglers. And how uh, how big of a system are you using when you're when you're using both worms in conjunction with one another? Um, so when I was using both worms, I was using uh, the no-till <clears throat> smart pots in there, and so for the worm bin in and of itself was probably about this big. So this is a eighteen gallon tote. Right on. Layton, you, uh, you're a big proponent of worms as well, right? As long as I remember talking before, uh, as long as we're not uh, overly feeding them, I think is the way that you kind of express that. Yeah, in past experience, I've seen a lot of people um, tend to get a little uh, aggressive in the feeding and then stuff goes anaerobic and you have other issues that happen. Uh, but no, I'm a big fan of, of uh, earthworms and I love, I love the way you put it up. Uh, low till <laughs> universal till Gaia till right let 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 nature do its tilling and we just keep our hands off and you know water and and love the plant so yeah I think that was a great way to put it big fan of worms so let's so get when into you start oh, so, I was sorry, sorry. when you when you yeah when you start with your your pots um what is your first mix are you are you adding native soils in there are you using more of a um, traditional no um, soilless medium or how do you start? So uh, in mixing soil, I generally use a compost. And so that compost would be about 50% from a compost or worm castings. And then the other 50% would be um, whether it be like a cow manure or a different type of compost. I'm always a big proponent of keeping it local and keeping it simple. So what's around you. Um, I used to live next to a cow farm and so I had a lot of access to a cow compost. Um, and then I had some access to goat compost somewhere else. And so it's really about using your native resources as well. Um, <clears throat> and then using some type of organic matter. I generally do use a sphagnum peat moss um, and then thinking about what are the amendments that you might want to use for your soil mixes. So everything from different types of uh, shells, mixtures in there to um, seeing about the mineral contents that you want to have in there to the microbial contents and letting that find a nice balance. And so along the lines of a super soil. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. Oh, I was just uh, so when you when you are building that up, I mean, your focus is kind of being proactive. I would think um, that's kind of the way that I've always been saying. So you have your worm bins going, um, producing those worm castings so that, that you can use that as a top feed before you probably put a plant into the uh, the raised bed. Is that correct? Yeah, and you know, just as like a human on the earth, whether or not I was growing plants, I always try to keep a worm bin in my house because we eat and we are producing waste all the time. And so whether um, it's always best to return it to nature in some type of way. And <clears throat> I, I always like to talk about Bokashi composting along these lines too. And that's a type of fermentation where you can compost literally anything. So everything from meats to 
um, citruses because of the worm bin, as you know, you want to keep it at a certain pH level. You never want to feed citruses to worms or meat products or any type of um, onions or garlic, but we eat those things. So what are we going to do with them? So I always like to keep some type of system going. Of course, you could always purchase these things. You don't have to have them on your own, but if you are having a garden, I find that it's a great way to have a, a system of perpetuation to always be cycling these through. And what I was going to say is you could feed the Just compost to the worms. And so in essence, you are feeding your entire um, waste products through the worm bin at one point or another. Can, can we stay on this topic for a minute? Because actually, before we started, I was talking to Brian about uh, Tina Trout, Lala's Garden, sent me some Bokashi, and I've been sprinkling it into my worm bin, into my uh, thermophilic tumbler. And I was kind of like, if someone could just give me, like, if each of you could talk about how you use Bokashi, like concrete examples of when and where to use it, that would be amazing. <laughs> jump in and start. Rachel, you, you were just talking about it. So why don't, why don't you go first? So, so you meant like, for example, you mentioned in the worm bin, where else do you, and, and kind of what, what's your application methodology and strategy and, and where else do you use it in your, in your yard, uh, wherever? Um, and, you know, it's interesting you said in your yard, because in permaculture, there's a great saying that, you know, every answer to every question is it depends. Um, I've always lived in places where I, I didn't have uh, outdoor compost because of uh, bears or wild animals to worry about. Um, there are, you know, types of facilities that you can create, but with the purpose of Bokashi composting was to have that cycle of perpetuate perpetuation. So I just kept it in like a five gallon bucket in my kitchen and sort of use the Bokashi like a lasagna of between your, your waste that you create as a human. And so you ferment that and then, then feed that to the worms. And then the worms create um, a vermicompost from the, eating the Bokashi, if that makes sense. And that is some of the best uh, worm castings that you're ever going to make yourself. Um, Leighton, you could probably go into more of like the biofilm and all the kind of stuff that we're creating there on another level. Um, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of using Bokashi in my compost. Um, I find that it really provides another level of uh, diverse foods. And I tend to get a, a real nice uh, predator plume. So predators are flagellates and amoebas. Um, these are the guys that do the, the real heavy lifting in the soil system as far as producing nutrients for the plant itself. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I, I love Bokashi in so many ways. It's, it has a, because it's gone through a different process, um, it's, it's providing uh, different levels of, of metabolites or secondary metabolites for, for the organisms and the bugs. Let's, let's not forget about those guys. They're, they're a big benefit to any soil system. And yeah, any food you provide um, obviously provides a, another form of um, particle bonding through glues. So your, your bacteria produce biofilms, your fungi produce um, what's called glomulin. And those are some of the most important um, foundations of soil structure. And again, it's all about aggregation. And that's the nice thing about worms. They too provide a tremendous amount of glues. Uh, to help bond those micro aggregates into bigger aggregates called macro aggregates. So, um, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to go on and on, but it's not about me. So let's get back to Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, do you want to go into a deeper reason why you're using uh, worm castings instead of, you know, buying something at the store even? Um, I think it gives you, you know, a sense of, of sovereignty and also understanding exactly everything that goes into your garden. I mean, there's a lot of great people doing a lot of great things. There's awesome worm companies out there that are uh, making wonderful worm castings. There's people that make soil mixes that you can build pre-mixed. Um, you know, there's all types of things out there and, and that's awesome to have accessibility to. But I also find that... 
um, when we have complete control over the whole system from, you know, beyond seed to shelf, but from your soul of the soil to shelf, uh, then you can really have control over it. And so, you know, for example, I was years ago trying to find some worms and I wanted to make sure that they were fed really high quality organic food. And I went to this big warehouse. They had um, large troughs there for the worms. And I pulled out a banana peel and it was a Chiquita banana with the, you know, the PLU number that started with a four. And if you're not familiar with PLU numbers, a four is conventional agriculture. If it starts with a nine, it's certified organic. So, you know, it doesn't matter what somebody tells you, you're not always quite sure. Uh, but like I said, there are a lot of amazing companies out there that do produce worm castings that you can certainly buy. Uh, the other thing that I love about worms and as you were mentioning, Leighton, about um, the, the glues that bind together. So when we hold worms, when we uh, touch worms and we can have a connection with them, it actually activates our microbiome. So I know uh, everybody in the living soil world and the cannabis industry loves to say, we feed the soil and not the plant, right? But if you think about your own self, um, we're feeding our soil, not ourselves. So we have a microbiome. And when we, when we have things like uh, marma points on our hands, if you're familiar with Ayurveda or acupuncture, and so when the, mer the worms can touch those marma points and the worms microbiome connects with our microbiome, um, and there's divine science and research about this I, I, everywhere. I think it was done in Harvard Medical School. It shows that it, it increases our microbiome, which then brings higher immunity, um, a more balanced system in our entire body. And so, you know, we're really feeding our own soil as well in having the worms there. So, and I just personally love having them as part of the process. I was going to say very well said. Yeah, that connection to soil. Um, I think that uh, a great way of looking at it, my love calls it this, it's uh, from soil to cell. So our cells. So from soil to seed to cell. And that's that's the connection to, to the soil, to the earth. And I'd love to ask you this question because I, I get to do this all the time and it's a real fun question. Where does the plant stop and the soil start in your mind, Rachel? Oh, wow. What a, what a great question. Well, you know, if we're, if we're really, really thinking about it, there, there is no stop. Um, everything is so interconnected. And even I remember, cause I, I have a degree in plant soil sciences, but when, when I was learning about soil and science and um, biology at the university level, you know, we didn't touch plants too much. So it wasn't really until after I graduated that I started to understand the cultivation aspect. But, oh, you know, a lot of the classes we were in, I remember uh, organic chemistry class, and it just blew my mind when the professor said, we've never actually seen an electron, right? They, you can have a microscope and you can get down to such a cellular level of looking at, you know, quarks and, and the quantum field, but we haven't actually seen it. And so I, remember, I think the textbook was like almost $300 for this class. And so I raised my hand and I was like, hold on. So you're telling me that this entire book, you've never even seen anything. And it's just that a group of scientists agreed on a certain um, understanding or overstanding, as some like to say. And so when we think about the quantum field in life, there really is no beginning and no end. And so that's why I say, you know, how you feel as a person when you step into your garden, um, how you feel about yourself is going to reflect how you feel about the plants. And, you know, when the soil starts and the plant starts, it actually is all connected. Um, everything is this force of energy. So when I get back to that electron analogy, um, you know, we've never seen it. It's it's spinning. And so we think it might be an electron, but do we really know? And so this is part of that great mystery and um, understand our understanding of ourselves, really. And so that's why I love 
gardening and working in the soil and working with plants because I find that it's such a great way to connect um, with who we are. Very it's well the easiest said. stress reliever, for sure. Well said, yeah. So yeah, what are some of the genetics you're running with? What's that? What are some of the genetics that you've been running with that, that you uh, enjoy growing? Oh, man. Yeah, I've worked with a lot of different genetics. So right now, I'm personally, this is my one plant that I'm growing right now. It's a rubber plant. But um, in terms of my past cannabis cultivation, I'm, I had just moved to Maine. So I'm on mid-coast Maine right now and sort of reestablishing myself. So here around Maine, hit me up. I'd love to do some uh, ganja yoga with everybody. But my past genetics, one of my favorite ones that I always loved was a uh, holy headband. It's Big Sur Holy crossed with headband. Those were bred by uh, Bodhi Seas. And then a few of other ones I've worked with, you know, many different ones from um, Pyramida to the Forum Cut Cookies, GG4. Um, I had a really great one that I loved. It, I think it was called the Purple Unicorn. Um, it was like a 1988 hash plant cross. And so what does this say? Is rubber plant sap any good for cloning? Oh, um, I don't know about the rubber tree plant for cloning, but I do know that we have a lot of excellent sources for cloning, like the willow tree. So you can take the leaves of the willow tree and soak them and create a cloning agent. Um, also honey is great for cloning. Um, aloe is what I always loved using for cloning. Um, I always try to keep an aloe plant on me at all times too. So if you're having a cannabis garden, you would wanna try to produce, uh, be a producer rather than a consumer. Uh, so you can close all those loops there. So that's why I would love having a worm bin um, and then always keeping tons of aloe plants around because you can use them in so many ways in the garden including uh, as a cloning agent. No, nice. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna um, I'm bounce back on the um, the uh, the headband. Boy, that's an old okay. cultivar, right? How, yeah. how did you get your hands on that one? Did you carry it for a while or? Um, yeah, I've, I've been running that since like, I don't know, the last, six or seven years or so. But I'm originally from the East Coast and I remember we had this genetic called the grape. And I believe it came from Florida up to Vermont. And I haven't seen it since, but when I was in Vermont, um, so if anyone, I don't know if you've heard of that one, it's just the grape. And it was like a really diesel-y, um, like not a grape ape or anything like that, but uh, it was, that was one of my most favorites that I ever had. But I've never really seen that around again. Yeah, it I seems like all the I good genetics of... come from Florida. What's that? <laughs> I said it seems like all the genetics come from Florida. I remember in Georgia, we would always get this stuff called Crippy that was really unique. Uh, that we, you know, I've been searching for for since I left Georgia. So it's very unique stuff that always seems to come out of Florida. Yeah, yeah, it was so, interesting. That was like over, you know, 15 years ago. <laughs> hell yeah, yeah. So where are you now in Maine? Um, I'm on mid-coast Maine around Bristol area. So I'm right, right on the beach here. <laughs> Rough and, life. Uh, nice. Yeah, it's interesting I because, you know, a lot of the things from the ocean is what our ancestors used in farming and gardening. And so... I was actually learning a lot. Um, I'm, I'm part of a conference with Brooke Medicine Eagle for Plant Spirit Medicine. And so she was teaching how the natives uh, always use things like kelp and oyster shells in their gardens because um, especially in the plains and around the mountain ranges, like the Rocky Mountains, um, it used to be a seabed. And so then they came together and formed the Rocky Mountains. And so I used to live in Durango and you could go around and find um, these little fossils called coronoids. And am I saying that correctly? I'm not sure, but there's um, so much history in the way that we're gardening today. All of the amendments that we put in, our ancestors have already been doing this forever. So it's cool to be in Maine and see, you know, there's the whole beach is covered with kelp here and different 
things that we can use as inputs. Um, even with the ocean, uh, I was learning about how people are distilling the ocean water to create their own sea salt for cooking. And, you know, how can we work with nature, not just in our gardens, but for ourselves as well? Very nice. Yes. I spent a lot of summers in Maine and, and yeah, I had a lot of deep connections with some of the old maniacs that grew up there and how they would harvest seaweed at certain times of the year, get that mm -hmm. into their beds, you know, in late fall so that it was available in spring. And, and the same thing, they would take the shells, smash them up and make a flower and, and provide that again as a source and then, and then hay everything in for the winter. So yeah, deep, I deep, deep love and respect for Maine. It's fond memories there. So when you're growing your own plants, Rachel, you're like, I see you on Instagram, you're taking the fan leaves, you know, you're, you're making teas and stuff that looks as fresh as could be, or at least back when you were in Colorado, I saw you making a lot of those teas and stuff. Could you talk about that a little bit? Uh, that's something that I would personally would like to know more about. Yeah. So uh, compost tea is another reason to be producing your own vermicompost. And so you can use your vermicompost that you produce in many different ways. And so one of the ways is by making a compost tea. And so that's using a process of um, oxygen and then having some type of food to feed the microbes. And so you could feed them different types of sugars. Um, people add different uh, plant constituents in. You could add molasses. And so it would bubble or brew um, to create the oxygenation process there. So I would brew it for about 24 hours um, and, and water that into your plants. And so um, you might want to do like just a fresh water or then the next water you could do a compost tea. Um, and then also if you're growing outdoors, a lot of farmers like to spray their fields with compost teas as well. Um, and so it's literally just like if you make a tea, a cup of tea, you have your herbs and then a bag and then the tea for it to steep through. And so with the vermicompost, compost, you would literally take um, and just to clarify, so yeah, the worms eat your food or maybe they're eating the fan leaves. And then this is their poop. It's literally their poop. And this you would put in some type of tea bag. Um, and again, be resourceful. I have a funny video on Instagram from a little bit ago of me using my old pantyhose. So, you know, I didn't have anything and I always try to work with what I have. And so, you know, pantyhose or tights, I just put the compost in there and tied it up and use that for that brew. Um, of course, you wanna make sure everything's clean and sterile, but um, yeah, so it's it's a great way to inoculate your plants. I think uh, Leighton, you were the one that taught me that one of the best ways to clean any kind of like worm setup is just to let it dry and then it becomes a, a like a flake and then you can just flake off everything. Was that you? Yeah, that's Coach? the bot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that's biofilm. Um, biofilm is the biggest issue in in compost tea brewing, uh, by far. And it's because if you do not let the air fully oxidize that that biofilm, what happens is you you get anaerobic zones. Uh, I'm not a big fan. A lot of the airlift compost tea brewers because there's just too many connections. There's too many pipes that you can't get to. Um, I'm a big fan of just the cone bottom. That's it with a with a blower at the bottom of it easy to clean, you know, open up the ball valve, everything dries out. And once that happens, then yeah, the, the, the biofilm turns to a flake and just peels right off and it's harmless and, and actually can provide another level of food for the next go around. So yeah, it's, that's the best way to clean is, is completely 100% air dry for 24 hours. And then you don't have any issues whatsoever. Are you familiar with the vortex brewers, Rachel and Layton? Have you guys used any of that? I've seen them. I haven't personally used the Vortex Brewer. I remember we made one. Um, yeah. uh, back in the day. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, all good. Uh, yeah, I've used them. I, again, I'm, I'm a proponent of just simple, simple, stupid. And the Vortex, again, and have more pipes. And, you know, they're trying to spin the current of water, which I get. It's kind of like a biodynamic thing. But um, I still find that any spaces, any, any surface that can't be you know easily accessed become problematic in the long run especially if you're using sugars or foods yeah 
And let's face it, at least at the beginning, we were, I personally was using so much uh, unsulfured blackstrap molasses looking back that uh, I was probably at first doing detrimental things to the plants and the, and the system itself. <laughs> yeah, that can be an issue. Too much is not good for sure. Yeah, too much sugar. Hey, Rachel, do you use a lot of do, do you use a lot of teas in your process, or just once in a while? You know, when I I've, I've experimented with different things. I have before a long time ago. I was doing every other water. I would do a compost tea, and then moving towards you know just once in a while. I mostly just like to use water, um, you know, and then just kind of inoculate it once in a while. Yeah, I feel like we're moving towards extracts. Yeah, I'm with That's you. Where a lot of us seem to be going. Yeah. And I've talked to people yeah, well, who, who aren't into compost teas at all. So it's it's interesting to see, you know, what will work best for your garden. Well, that's the beauty of uh, the extracts is that you're not doing a long-term brew. You're just stripping out the biology and applying it right away. So you don't have to worry about biofilm. Um, and some of the other issues that come along with, with tea brewing. I mean, let's face it, if you go just a little bit too long in your brew, um, you've chewed up all the oxygen and going anaerobic, and we all know the consequences of applying an anaerobic tea to an aerobic soil. It's not pretty. You, you went back big time. Um, anaerobic teas are fine in dirt where there is nothing to get it established, but it's, it's horrifically damaging when you apply something that's completely anaerobic to an aerobic soil system. So yeah, that's, I think everybody's starting to understand the tea brewers, tea brewing as a whole can be pretty problematic and it's just simpler to just do an extract. I mean, like your pantyhose trick, that's a great one. Just stuff them full of, of castings or, or whether it's compost and then just wring it out, just put it in a bucket with your hands and just keep wringing it. Another good one is a paint strainer. Um, you yeah. can get those for like 15, 20 cents at the hardware store and, and, and do the same thing. Just, keep wringing it and squeezing it and wringing it. And then now you've got this beautiful, dark, rich extract that's ready to go. Exactly. I feel like you're more connected too. So, you just uh, so like are you, you back. Sorry for the delay guys. Totally it's, dude. It's quite a delay today. Go ahead, Layton. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was just, I was, I was saying the same thing. I mean, it's, that whole connection, like she was talking about, where you know the, the your skin is connected to the slime or the worms, or your skin is connected to the to the soil or the extract that you're making. Um, I make a couple of products that are uh, like amazing for skin. Uh, so one of them is this uh, super fine, basically screened at 120 micron to 47 micron. So it's just like um, almost talcum powder like, and it's, it's greasy. And when you s smooth it on your skin, you can just feel all of that that biological release into your into your system. And uh, I know people that have had like eczema, and they put it on it, and it's really helped a lot in, in you know taking the bad guys out of play by overcompetition because you have such so many good guys. And yeah, this delay stinks today. Is it me or is it everybody else too? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting yes. you bring up eczema because that's. Um a sign of imbalance in our microbiome and our body. I personally used to have eczema a lot as a child. And so I've learned quite extensively about eczema and it, it has to do with the foods that we eat. So the nutrition and oftentimes it's the instability of too much sugar in our system. And so it presents itself as a type of inflammation through the skin. So it's almost like we're feeding, uh, imagine your plant. So if we think about that concept of feeding the soil and we're not feeding the plant, um, eczema would be like a pest uh, or inflammation shows up as imbalance in our ecosystem. And so, you know, it's great to have both internal and external ways that we can combat that. So I'm glad you brought up eczema. Yeah, my pleasure. I mean, I've, I think that's our biggest problem as a species is that we don't, we don't play in the mud when we're kids. We don't eat mud pies, you know? I mean, God, I used to, they'd had to drag me out of the swamp every day. <laughs> so yeah. I'm fortunate that I got, you know, a lot of time, a lot of dirt time, man, a lot of there dirt time. There was a time. Funny, funny article that came out that I read. It was like, parents, it's now safe to let your kids play in the dirt. 
because um, they had done some research that shows that the soil microbiome, once you touch it, releases indirectly serotonin through our brain. So, you know, playing in the dirt, putting your hands in the soil actually makes you happy. It makes you healthier. And so I think especially in this day and age in the current uh, climate that we're seeing politically, spiritually here on this planet, um, it's so dire important that we have a connection to nature and we have the tools and the skills to stay deeply intrinsically connected to nature, whether we bring it inside um, or we can go outside and then have the knowledge that um, we can all grow our own, our own food, our own plants, um, anywhere that we are in any circumstance. Absolutely. This is good to have. Mm -hmm. I really do feel like um, if, if things went to shit, like where we all had to band together, uh, knowing how to improve the, the soil system for the community has got to be up there again. Uh, in my opinion, it was the ranchers and the farmers back in the day that I felt like really uh, drove this country and, and the ones that were actually wealthy and that kind of stuff. And now a farmer is almost kind of poo pooed, uh, at least in Atlanta where I grew up. Um, we, we never thought about really anything organic. You know, this is obviously like 20 years ago when I was living there, but we, no one ever talked about organic, um, anything metaphysical. And so it was really eye opening for me when I moved out to Colorado to start to resonate to myself that what I'm putting in my body every single day is starting to affect me and, and creates my, um, you know, my overall well being. And I know that's probably laughable now, but growing up in Georgia, no one, at least in my sphere, ever talked to me about that whatsoever. I thought chicken was chicken, you know, fruits are fruits. I, I didn't realize that what, what really went behind the scenes, um, truthfully, until Food Inc. came out. I don't know if you guys, did you guys ever see that? Came out maybe 15 years ago, 10 years ago? I think I did. I remember um, when Omnivore's Dilemma came out in by Michael Pollan and I was in um, high school when I had started reading that book and really understanding about food and compost. Um, I started a composting system at my high school and we had like a little school garden and that's where, where I really started to get into it. But I think what's so important about our food systems is that um, in the cannabis industry, especially in this living soil community that we have, a lot of us like to say the term to get off the bottle, right? We don't need bottled nutrients. We don't need fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, but some of us treat our plants so much better than we treat ourselves. And so seeing how we can really bridge that connection and understand that we are part of, part of this whole system and this whole cycle. And, you know, whether you're eating plants that have transformed the sun's energy or you're eating an animal that ate those plants, in essence, what we're doing is we're living off the sun. And so in um, Sanskrit, we call that Agni. And so that's the the energy from the sun that we're ultimately living and thriving and surviving off of. And so how can we eliminate any type of bottle input um, through our food system as well? And I think, uh, you know, we really need to look at everything from our supply chains, you know, whether it's through the gardening practices of your food or your herbs and seeing how we can create a supply chain that's sustainable for the end consumer as well as the producer, the farmers, because that's where a lot of that gets taken away. And we have what we call cheap food, um, mm -hmm. you know, things like fast food, but we see that it actually has a longer uh, detrimental impact and creates a lot of suffering from the people that have to, you know, farm and create it and end up, paying the ultimate price at the end. What are some of the uh, like herbs and nutrients and stuff that you use uh, to improve your overall health? Um, for myself and my body? Oh, well, you know, I'd say the, the first and foremost way to improve your health is through whole foods, eating whole foods from the earth that are grown organically. Um, we can always take a supplement of an herb, but when we have it in its whole form is the most uh, bioavailable way and the most nutritious way to obtain those nutrients. 
Um, but for myself, especially now, as it's the fall and we're heading into winter, um, I've, I like to live in accordance to the season and also in accordance to what we call our dosha or our constitution. And so in Ayurvedic medicine, my constitution is vata. So it's very um, dry and air qualities. And so I try to eat foods that will balance my system. So if you think about the constitutions as sort of like a genetic cultivar, right? You wouldn't, cre you wouldn't treat uh, a, one cultivar the same way that you might treat another. They're going to grow in different ways. They're going to have different lengths that they grow at. They're going to require perhaps different nutrients. Um, I, I had such a great time learning all weekend. I love learning from everybody on your panels, but especially Dr. Elaine Ingham. And she was talking so much about the soil of, you know, the plant is going to output what it needs and through um, the exudates. And just like us as humans, we're going to output what we need. So all of our needs are going to change and, and be different. So that's kind of like what your constitution is. So what do you need? So someone who's really dry like me would need a lot of avocados, especially at this time. And then as we move into the winter, you want to have a lot of warming foods and grounding foods. So um, through the lens of Ayurveda, a warming herb would be something like cinnamon and cardamom. Um, I just made cardamom pancakes with blueberries this morning. And so the blueberries were wild harvested in Maine because they're local. If I was living in Colorado, I might not have that same meal because it's not um, a local availability for me. So really trying to work with what are the foods and the plants around you? Um, who are your neighbors? Build community. You know, maybe you have a neighbor who um, has a certain crop and you're growing a different type of crop and you can trade and share together. And um, garlic is great for your immunity. And so I was cooking with a lot of garlic last night. I made a, a vegetable quiche. <clears throat> and so for myself and my body, I eliminate all dairy and gluten to try to remain balanced because um, that's what I found that I, I need for myself. And then let's see, what are some other warming herbs at this time, like turmeric and ginger. Mm -hmm. So I, I've been drinking ginger tea every night. I love to have sort of a nightly tea ceremony. And so recently during the fall, I've been drinking a lot of ginger. Whereas say we were having this conversation in the middle of summer, I might say peppermint because that's a really cooling and uplifting herb. And so thinking about, you know, where is, where is the earth right now? What is the time and space? What's the lunar cycle? <clears throat> Who am I to think about what would be best for you in this moment? Especially as we come into winter, um, what do you think about, you know, taking in um, like bone broth um, every single day? Is that something that you should be focused on? Something new that I was uh, learning about these last few weeks? Um, absolutely, yeah. So again, every every person may require a different type of diet, but bone broth is excellent way to get a lot of iron into the body. <coughs> And, uh, and things that are hot, too, in temperature. So it's probably not a good time to eat ice cream right now <laughs> or make smoothies. I know so many people are so into being health conscious and love making smoothies. But uh, in, in Ayurveda, we say like increases like. So if it's cold out and you're drinking cold smoothies, you're going to increase that uh, imbalance in the body. So even though something may be healthy at one time, it might not be healthy at this time. So bone broth is great. Um, the other thing is thinking about the part of the plant that you're eating. So <clears throat> with a potato, right, it grows under the ground. And so it's going to be very grounding for you. Um, there's a, a fun, funny joke I have with some of my herbalist friends saying that you know, if you are a fruitarian, so if you just eat fruit, um, you're not going to be very grounded because you're only eating things that grow in the air. And so you're going to be very airy and not really have a sense of groundedness. And, and so right now, as we go into the winter, we really want to feel 
grounded and stable and strong. Um, so building up all of those reserves in the body. So one of the things that we make is a kitchery. And so that's um, having lentils and beans and different rice with different spices together. And you might do like a kitchery cleanse for seven days or so where you're just eating that and letting your digestive tract uh, sort of cleanse out. A bit. Did you study under a master? Hmm? I said you keep referring to Ayurveda, and it's like really interesting. Did you study under um, a, a, an elder? I've studied with many different people, but in regards to Ayurveda, I mostly studied with um, Dr. Indu Aurora, and so she is from India and had came over to the U.S. a few years ago and has so much wisdom to impart. And the thing about um, India is that a lot of these practices, well, these all of these practices, yoga, were designed for men. And so it wasn't traditional to have women learning this medicine. Um, and so she learned it uh, through her roots in India and then came over here. So her name's Indu Aurora. So I've learned quite a lot through her. Um, and then I've done my yoga training at the Shambhala School of Yoga. And then in regards to my background, it's through uh, UMass Amherst. And so they were one of the first agricultural schools in the United States, the Stockbridge School of Agriculture. So I got my bachelor's there. Um, and it was interesting because I really loved cannabis my whole life, basically, since I was like 13 years old. I just bowed down to that plant in reverence um, so humbly. And so when I was in school, I was trying to study cannabis at the university level. And this was in, so I started college in 2006 to around 2010. And I was working with um, Dr. Lyle Craker. And at the time, you could not legally obtain the seeds. And I don't know if you're familiar with all the cannabis studies, but most of them were coming out of, <clears throat> I believe it was Mississippi. Um, and it was just below human grade cannabis to be studying. I know that MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies had refused their government cannabis. It was moldy. And that was the, the cannabis that they were doing research on, moldy, grossly grown cannabis. So instead of doing that, I couldn't do it. It was illegal. I ended up traveling to Peru with um, Professor Chris Killam, who's also known as the medicine hunter to work with the Shipibo tribe out of the uh, Peruvian Amazon. And I worked with <coughs> the plants there. And what was really interesting is that they were using all of their <clears throat> indigenous knowledge for gardening and they were using permaculture practices. Um, we worked a lot with many different Amazonian plants, including ayahuasca. And it was really when I started working with ayahuasca that I refined and redefined my relationship to cannabis. Wow, you went to UMass or ZooMass and then ended up in the Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's yeah, awesome. It was, it was really awesome because um, I was a pre-med major and UMass is a state university and, um, you know, all of our labs were sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. I had a lab that was like a Merck sponsored laboratory where we literally had to use WebMD and basically learn about prescription drugs. And so the more I got into the pre-med studies, the less turned on I was by it. And the more I wanted to connect to nature and to plant medicine. Um, so I'd found this class called the Shaman's Pharmacy. And um, it completely changed my life. And so instead of going to medical school, I ended up uh, going to yoga school, moving out to Colorado and sort of dedicating my life to the cannabis plant medicine. Uh, wow, that Rachel, can we talk more about story. ayahuasca? Hmm. Sure. So um, ayahuasca is a plant medicine. It's a vine out of uh, the Amazon rainforest. It grows wildly. And the great thing about the plant medicine is that 
it does not work on it, its own. It needs a companion plant to be activated. So <clears throat> in the spiritual world, we say that, you know, it needs a companion. In the scientific world, we say that it needs an MAOI inhibitor um, because, you know, if you look at ayahuasca, it has what we call DMT in it that it's releasing and the other plant, um, Yage leaf, or there's a few other different leaves that you can combine with the plant and brew it together. Uh, and just like, you know, if you're making your own soil mix, your energy goes into that soil. Or if you're brewing ayahuasca, your energy goes into the brew that you make. Um, and so they say, well, how did you know out of, you know, the thousands of different vines in the jungle and the hundreds of thousands of different plant leaves that you could mix these two together and get this magical combination for healing? And, and what they say is, well, the plants told us. Um, and, and what a divine connection with nature to be able to listen to the plants so much so that you can communicate with them. Um, and the reason why I wanted to start off our talk today having sort of a grounding meditation and sound is because we are walking around a so at threat. Um, everything is putting our nervous system into a state of threat. Um, from artificial lighting to our cell phones, the EMF rays, even the computers that we're on today is putting us into that sympathetic nervous system fight or flight. And so um, when we use these practices of yoga and meditation and mindfulness, we allow ourselves to come into balance and to be able to communicate with the plant spirit. And so with this particular tribe, the Shipibo tribe, they see the plants as living beings, that they are, the plants are the guru. And so guru, uh, by definition in Sanskrit, means to show the light. Um, so, you know, they pass the wisdom to us. They've been here so many years before us humans arrived. Of course, they have so much wisdom to share with us. Um, so working with ayahuasca, the very first time I sat in ceremony, the shaman um, will sing to you these songs, which we call ikados. And the shaman came, um, her name was Estela Pogosa, and she came and she sat to sing with me. And I, I don't know um, Shipibo, but I did hear the word uh, marijuana. She kept saying marijuana, marijuana. And um, the way that ceremony works at this particular place you drink for about eight days. So you'll drink and then um, the next morning discuss what happened in your journey in your ceremony and then drink again that night and do that process for eight days. So you'll have an eight day long plant ceremony. Um, and you know, some people might do it for months or some people might just do it for one day. And it just kind of, it depends on your own healing journey. But the first time I did it, I was like, why does she keep saying marijuana, marijuana? And I, right, I was in college. So at the time I was living a, a perceived healthy life, but actually I was very unhealthy at the core. Um, I was partying a lot and I was in essence abusing the cannabis plant. Um, and I didn't realize that until I started working with ayahuasca. So when I say that that uh, plant helped me to redefine my relationship with cannabis is because of how she taught me to respect the plant medicine. Um, so it's funny because they say ayahuasca is uh, alpha female and then also ganja, she's an alpha female, right? So most of the plants that we work with, cannabis is a dioecious plant, so meaning there's male and females. And so the female is generally the part that we work with, uh, that we grow, you know, it's always no one wants to find a male in their garden when they're sexing their seeds or their clones. Um, so what the shaman says is that, you know, no cannabis before or after ceremony, you actually, they actually have you fast. Um, and I went and I smoked it anyways, cause I was smoke, I would wake up and hit a bong and um, smoke all day, every day. And that was just sort of my jam. Um, and so working with the ayahuasca plant medicine, she just put it in such a different way of understanding that we need to respect this relationship just like any relationship that we have with any person, um, including ourselves. So that was quite an eye-awakening experience. 
And if you're not familiar with ayahuasca, um, it's the vine that grows in the jungle. And when you drink it, it's very, <clears throat> it's a ceremony that you have for healing. Um, and there's a lot of purging involved, um, whether it's through vomiting or you might shit yourself or a lot of sweating. Um, and so you, you're letting go. It's like an unraveling or some describe it as a polishing the mirror, right? So we can really truly see ourselves and see what we need. So I like to say, you know, every ceremony is so different, but she really shows you what you need to see. So for me at that time, what I needed to see was uh, my abusive relationship with cannabis and how to realign and redefine with that plant. But also in doing that, um, redefining all the relationships in our lives. I know you're at kind of the Very forefront, well at least uh, in my peer group, of understanding this stuff. And so I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to break this down. Um, I've done DMT once in my life. I was able to, with what I've been known as uh, blast off. Could we talk about that for a little bit? And what what is um, that? Yeah, so I personally have never smoked DMT, so I don't have that experience because, um, you know, sort of a part of me feels like I'm still integrating the ayahuasca medicine. So what I've heard is that they're completely different experiences in the way that um, we, we connect with a plant. So if you think about cannabis, right, we have like full spectrum extracts and then we have isolates, right? So DMT, if you isolate that compound and then smoke it, it's like smoking an isolate. And then if you drink the ayahuasca brew, I might compare that to like a full spectrum. So you're getting the terpenes and the all the cannabinoids and every part of the plant. Um, and then an ayahuasca experience, when you drink it, it lasts hours and even into the night to the next morning. So it might be like four to eight hours long. Whereas I've heard smoking DMT could be a very short and and please speak to this because I I don't know, uh, like a, a 10 to 15 minute experience. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. Um, and so when you're doing the ayahuasca and I'm blasting off, are are we seeing the same thing? Because I've, I've seen that a lot of people are kind of saying the same stuff about like, I saw these things called clock elves. Oh, um, Have you ever seen stuff like that? So what's really interesting is there's these things called trip reports. And I have a, a, one of my really great friends is a scientist and researcher and she's been collecting trip reports and, and scientists have been collecting trip reports, you know, for 20, 30, 50 years, ever since we've really started to explore psychedelics. And a trip report is basically somebody is tripping and then after they report on it. So report what they see. And yes, um, I've heard them also referred to as machine elves. And many people can see many different things. And we can see it in our own selves and then tell our experience to somebody else and they may have had a similar experience. And then I've also seen where I've been in ceremony and um, other people have seen the same entity or the same experience that I experienced at the same time. So oftentimes when we work in the plant spirit world, people say, you know, is that me thinking the thoughts or is that the plant communicating to me, right? So if you say you smoke weed and you're getting all of these crazy thoughts or ideas, is that you thinking it or is that the cannabis in you downloading those messages? Well, that's the great mystery. But for example, I've been in ceremony where uh, there was sort of like a dark entity, a darkness spirit come up from the center of the room that took the form of a giant tarantula. And I am terrified personally of spiders. And normally in ceremony, uh, you lay down for most of the time. And I jumped up out of my bed. I jumped up and you're in a room, you know, with other people in a maloka in a, a circle. And I saw many different other people also jump up. So we all saw that same like 
dark spider spirit. It was huge. It was, you know, the size of me. Imagine a spider the size of you coming at you. And um, so when we work with the plant medicine, I like to think of it as it's lifting a veil. Um, so I think all these things are, you know, this is just my own thought, but I think all of these spirits and these deep connections um, are always here and around us, but we just can't see it. We just can't access it. So in that moment, in that particular ceremony, um, and this is what has made me believe in magic. I'm like, the things that I've seen, uh, you, you just don't come back from that. <laughs> and so um, it's like the bondage of knowledge. Once you know, you can't unknow it. And so it's really, really so interesting and magical to see that, wow, everyone had that same experience. Um, I've also witnessed a shaman working with a particular a, a girl next to me. She was having a really hard time. And <clears throat> usually we purge for ourselves, but she couldn't purge. And so the shaman came over and I watched this with my eyes. He pulled some darkness, a dark spirit out of her and he purged it up for her. Um, and then, you know, so it's so interesting to really think about like, what is life? What is real? What's reality? And it's everything that we create and perceive it to be. Um, and so with the machine elves, back to that, one of the first times in my first ceremonies, I've had that experience where at first it was sort of terrifying to me. I didn't know what was happening and they appeared like very tiny little elf like fairies. And I came to this point where I just had to surrender to it. I'm like, I'm here. I'm in the jungle. This is happening. There's these tiny little elves all over me. Um, let me sur surrender to it. And that's what was so beautiful about having a yoga practice. I already had been practicing yoga for about five years before I first sat with the ayahuasca plant. So I, I understood about breathing. Um, I understood about how to uh, hold my body in asana or mudra, which is how we hold our hands. And um, I had been purging a lot. So what we might call stuck in the bucket, everyone has a bucket that you can puke into essentially. And I realized my hands were in little fists. I was just you know, going through all my darkness. And my yoga practice came to me where I just had to open my hands and then I sat up and straight and tall and all of the dark visions I was seeing literally turned into like sparkles and rainbows. And that's when the machine elves came. And so I just kind of like lay down and surrendered to it and what we call Shavasana or corpse pose, which is in yoga, one of the most important poses where we integrate. Um, and so laying down in this pose, all of those machine elves came and did a sort of surgery to me. They cut open my skull and they were rewiring my brain. Um, they cut open my heart and they had these like levers and pulleys and they were uh, adjusting my heart space. And they just went through my entire body, like a complete scan head to toe, um, healing me. So I've experienced the little elves as a healing entity and a lot of other people that I've talked to have also had similar experiences with the elves. And they said that they were um, helping and friendly as well. So, you know, are they really there? Are the elves just always here helping us? And that when we use DMT, we're able to awaken to their presence? I don't know. I, you know, that's the great mystery to really keep looking into. There's there's past like uh, tribes and stuff that I would also attest to the the machine elves, or is this like a newer phenomenon now that more and more people are doing ayahuasca and DMT? I think that you know there's many similarities woven through cultures. Um, I was speaking a lot about uh, Maria Sabina who works with mushrooms. And so that's a completely different entity, right? It's, it's not in the plant world, it's in the fungi world. And she had called them her children. And so, she, you know, was she seeing little machine elves when she worked with mushrooms? I'm not sure. That would be a great question to ask her if she were alive today. but all of our ancestors, there is so much um, plant medicine all over the world um, from, you know, Africa, we have ibogaine and 
um, different plants all over that we've been using to transform our consciousness and to transform our current awareness of understanding life and ultimately living our life in balance. But um, yeah. I feel like today might be where, you know, when we talked about cannabis 15, 20 years ago, people were all like, oh my goodness. Uh, but for me, I know um, opening up and just jumping in the water and trying it myself with so many people, I think it took me about two years of researching my own little research uh, to actually get up the nerve to do it. Um, and to actually, I smoked um, five grams in one sitting um, and then blasted off. I mean, that was my experience. So that's, I appreciate you taking time, breaking down the machine elves and stuff, because that's the kind of thing where I talk to a lot of people about this and they all kind of are talking about that. And, uh, you know, for me growing up in Georgia, I mean, it, some of that stuff is really hard to to uh, open your eyes to. But once I've seen that, um, now it's starting to make sense more of, I mean, we're sitting here in infinite space floating in a, in a <laughs> planet Earth. Uh, I have forgotten that, I would say, the majority of my life. I was also just caught up in a lot of things, especially the material things when I was younger. Um, and so I really uh, appreciate and admire that you're taking the time to speak to us like this today, uh, because I know that part of this is uh, everyone's journey. And I'm not saying that everyone needs to do this or anything. I just, I personally did that. I know that it's something that's, um, you know, you've shared many stories with me in the past. So I just wanted to take the time to uh, say that I really do appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. And you know, on, on that vein too, um, one does not have to consume a plant in order to receive its medicine. Um, so if anyone was interested in looking at different types of plants that they can work with, you know, when we start any type of relationship, you might just gaze or use your different senses um, smelling a plant. I know that if I've been around other people who are on psychedelics, um, I, you call that a contact high. I certainly feel that energy and I feel like I'm tripping even if I've taken nothing. Um, so, and dosing is another great thing. They say like the, the dose of any type of plant determines if it's a medicine or a poison. Um, and so you said you had five grams of DMT and you know, what does that look like for you versus somebody else and their body and looking at their constitution. And so I always like to tell people to, if you are going to work with any type of plant, start very small and then work your way up. Um, and I have a funny story and now, now I think it's funny, but <laughs> at the time it wasn't, um, working with ayahuasca, I'd worked with it for so many years and in my life was personally having a difficult time and so i was sitting in ceremony and i had my cup um and then laid down and as you call it blasting off nothing had happened um and i went back i was like give me another cup to my shaman to the to the uh carandera and um she's like okay i'll pour you another cup and i drank that down and still nothing had happened and i was like what i've never had two cups why is nothing happening um and so i went back for a third dose i was like give me more like i i am here for ceremony i wanna i wanna like go into the space with the ayahuasca and i was like so eager and really craving her knowledge and her wisdom and mind you i had already been in ceremony before and she had given me directions and I didn't listen to them. Um, and she said, you know, you need to do X, Y, and Z in your life. And I went back to the States and I didn't do it. I didn't listen to the medicine. And so here I was trying to connect with her again. And she basically told me like, F you, you didn't listen to me. I'm not gonna do anything with you. Um, and she brought me to this just such a crystal clear space. But that's why it's such potent magic, because it it almost doesn't matter about the dose. You can have just a tiny, tiny drop of something and blast off and go into another galaxy and another world. But you can drink cup after cup after cup of ayahuasca and go nowhere because that's the message that you needed at that time. And so it's so, so I mean, you can try to describe it through the lens of science, but I also like to describe it sort of in understanding the quantum field and understanding us through the spirit spirit realm. Blayton, you want to wow, add that to that? Was beautifully said. 
Oh yeah, you know this. My phone is so choppy. Like I'm getting, I'm getting it, but it's like I don't know whether I should say something. Um, but you no, know, that's a beautiful story. I've I've had other people say similar or have similar experiences where if the plant's not going to talk to you, it's not going to talk to you. It's going to disassociate. Um, and I loved what you said about when you're starting these things. I mean, now that mushrooms have uh, finally broken through the gate, at least in Oregon. Um, I think that more and more people should like microdose and start really, really small. Um, just grind a tiny little bit up, put it in tea, and see if something happens. See if see if she's ready to communicate with you. Um, and if not, then you know, wait a few days, try a little bit more. But I think that the the, the plants can offer us so much help on so many levels. The their their discussion of fight or flight. I mean, now more than ever, all of us as as a species are so stressed um if you read anything if you talk to anybody across the globe it's the same thing it's like where are we what is going on and i think that now more than ever would be a good time to 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 acquaint yourself introduce yourself to some of these plants um not all plants are for everybody but again you you will never know unless you try but don't get crazy don't go for a hero's dose you know, just a little bit, just a tiny little bit and try it. And, you know, from some, I, I've microscoped, uh, microdosed everything um, that has been discussed here and blotter and everything else. And I've always enjoyed that, that little tiny bit of eh, something going on, but not like I'm blasted. I'm, I'm still functional. I can have a conversation, but I'm still just a little bit more aware. Like, the light looks a little different. The plants, I, I can connect with them uh, on another level, and you know, and I think that is that is that is the gateway. That's the stair, the first step in the stairway to a to a higher conscious, a better understanding of who you are and and the demons you have and the angels that you have, because you're going to have both. And you know, really cool story about the the elves. Yes, I'm well aware of those, and and yes, I've seen things pulled out of someone's throat that I can't explain this just black matter just pulled right out and so you know it it's real it's it's just that we're not normally uh living on a on a metaphysical plane that we can see this stuff and 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 understand it and and when you talk to uh, people about this who who are like never tried it they, they're, they're like you're crazy you you fucking crazy but you're not, you, you have made the first step. You have made that connection uh, to the next plane, whatever that is. And Paul Stamets talks about this, you know, in, in some of his, you know, hero doses, what, what he's seen and, and what he's been exposed to. I mean, he even just talks about aliens. And I, I truly believe there are interdimensional beings living around us uh, all the time, but we can't see them and we can't connect with them because we're not on the same plane. But I think we can all get there. It's just a matter of, you know, finding what works best for, with you and your body. Yeah, and bringing back the conversation full circle, what Brian was talking about with breath and feeling high through your breath. Um, and you can reach all of these states just through conscious breathing. Um, and so, you know, we have all of these wonderful plant allies in Mother Nature's apothecary to work with us, but we can also know that all of the answers are ultimately inside of us already. And so, you know, all of these different things from the news to um, technology bring so much fear in, in, into our innate being. You know, it goes into the soil of our system, into our microbiome. But when we step into nature and I, you know, put it on my list every day to to go out and have time in nature, to meditate, to put my hands in the soil. Um, I also keep a worm bin here because I like to put my hands in and touch them every day. I'm touching them right now uh, because it's releasing serotonin in my brain. It's bringing me to a sense of um, parasympathetic nervous system. If you eat all day and you're in your sympathetic nervous system, you will not digest and assimilate those nutrients. They will just pass right through you. So you have to be in a state of, of uh, digestion where you can assimilate all of those nutrients. And so connecting with nature will really allow us to do that so we can be peaceful and we can be um, harmonious with life. You know, we are a part of the ecosystem. We so often think that 
we're separate and different, but you know, we're essentially a part of this whole. Leighton, you want to add to that as um, well, bud? I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I love, I love the the way you're explaining this, and you're absolutely right. You can achieve amazing things through just breath alone. Um, but meditation is another one that, that we haven't really talked about, um, and how powerful that can be in, in pressing your reset button. Um, I personally spend 20 minutes a day, uh, mid afternoon, um, just calming down, um, breathing. Um, in and out. Um, sometimes I do counts. Sometimes I just do it freestyle. Um, but I, I, without that, I think I would have gone crazy a long, long time ago. And uh, something else that I wanted to bring up a point on was that, you know, positivity. And I think you, you, Rachel, you touched on this and how powerful positivity can be. And just as equally powerful is negativity. And we've all had negative uh, energy vampires that we come across or perhaps even in our lives. And I've noticed, you know, years ago when I was in a, a, a pretty ugly place that when I was having negative thoughts and anger and frustration, next thing I know, someone would fly by me and cut me off on the highway or push me out of line in a store. So, so these kinds of like staying positive, staying in a great headspace will prevent that kind of attraction to these negative forces and negative energies. And maybe you can touch a little bit more on that, Rachel. Yeah, um, you know, back to that understanding of we, we've never seen an electron, that everything is a force and everything is moving energy. We literally, uh, the law of attraction, we attract what we put out. We create who we are. Um, and so I do want to speak a little bit on toxic positivity, though, because, you know, to just disregard any negative emotion and say, uh, look on the bright side can also be toxic for us, too. So in the lens of mindfulness, by definition, it's to pay attention to the present moment without judgment. So if we're having a negative thought or we're feeling frustrated, something's not working out for us in our life, um, that's OK. Acknowledge it with awareness and most importantly, without judgment. And, and feel it, feel those emotions, and then let them pass through you. Um, and so coming back to that space of understanding the law of attraction, that whatever it is that we are putting out there is what will attract back to us. Sort of like uh, what you were saying, Leighton, if you start your day off and you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, so to speak, then the rest of your day will sort of follow that lead. Um, and so it's so important to, to <clears throat> think about things like meditation or having a practice that can set the tone for us and always bring us back to this awareness of, you know, I don't want to sound cliche, but we are truly all one. Um, you know, if you think about on a scientific level, the cells in my body are just actually vibrating. Um, and they're not actually connected. And so when I first learned about this, again, in, in university level, I was like, well, why can't we walk through walls? Um, and that's just our perception of reality as a human. But it's, it's the, and, and you can see it on the level of soil when we talk about aggregates and how the different molecules start to bind together. Um, they're just coming they're not actually touching but there there's a certain little space around it and they're always moving everything's always moving and so our thoughts determine our feelings and our feelings um, determine our speech and that determines our character or our awareness but it all begins in the thoughts and so if we can start to have non-judgmental thoughts um, without acknowledging again acknowledging the thought that comes up not judging it, letting it move by, and then remain in the present moment again, because now we're in the next moment. And so that's what meditation does. It lets that chitta or that chatter in the mind truly quiet down and just let us come into this present space. Beautifully said. Hey, uh, Leighton, so to tie some of this in back into like cannabis stuff, um, when I was learning about uh, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, um, I remember they were saying that it, those literally vibrate and then multiply. Uh, if I'm saying that correctly, could you could you talk a little bit more on that if you if you can? 
Absolutely. Um, all right. So this goes back to the understanding of that the earth actually vibrates. And I believe it's um, 3.21 uh, megahertz. Um, I believe that we all tune our instruments to 3.1. And the reason we tune our instruments to that was because the Pope decided that all instruments should be tuned at the same level so that we all can experience the music equally across all speech, uh, uh, races at the time. And so he was close. He was, he was pretty damn close to what the actual vibration of the earth is. And if you want to dive down a little bit deeper, look into Brownian motion. So Brownian motion is um, the force that creates uh, a, a, a wobble or a vibration uh, to happen on a cellular level. So when you're looking under the microscope, and you're trying to identify the difference between a small particulate, uh, a one micron particulate versus a one micron bacteria, the bacteria will actually be vibrating, kind of bumping around. And that's basically an expression of that vibration. And this goes back to what Rachel was talking about, staying in a positive vibration, not lowering your vibration, but staying in a high vibration. So yeah, we can control a lot of how we react and feel to to outside uh, influences based on staying in a positive frame. And, and like she said, yeah, let feel things. Don't block them. Dude. Blocking them, uh, look into the shadow effect. I mean, horrible things can happen to good people because they're denying that shadow side of their personal. And so you need to confront that. And I think in a lot of ways, ayahuasca helps you do that. And just know that part exists in you but don't encourage it and don't deny it because either of those things are going to lead to uh, probably some pretty negative consequences in your life. But to, to go back to the understanding of vibration and how um, that is basically the essence of all life on this planet is because of, of, of these kind of forces, magnetic forces. They're actually called paramagnetic because they're very, very small forces. They're not like electrical currents. I talked a little bit about those kinds of influences in that in that soil uh, lecture uh, last Saturday about understanding paramagnetics, whether it's uh, rock, clay, um, or or the connection between a couple organisms. Another thing you touched on is that yeah, when two people touch, they actually don't touch. There's still there's still atoms in between, even though you feel like you're touching, you're really not. Um, and then you can get into crazy shit like understanding that uh, a water molecule, um, for instance, a cell, which is one micron, has 3.3 billion molecules of water in it. And so that, that water is, you know, kind of like this lubricant or connection, uh, magnetic or, or electrical connection between uh, um, our cells and the way they communicate. Um, it's our understanding, we like all cannabis growers get EC, electrical conductivity. But as we learn more and more, more in science, like about perhaps redox potential and some of these other fourth and fifth stages of water, we're really starting to understand that that connection, that that paramagnetism, uh, whether it's a, a you know a proton or an electron, um, they're really critical. And so the best way to actually kind of see the smallest level of magnetic influence is to look under a microscope and watch a bacteria dance around in front of you. It's, it's mind blowing, literally. Hey, uh, Peter, did you want to, you talked about, there was a question for us that, uh, you, you like kind of set up there. Thanks for asking Brian. Yes, sir. You guys ready? All right. So your channel, so this is from Derek, uh, who tunes in regularly from the great country up north of Canada. Uh, your channel has helped me in my transition from liquid organic <clears throat> to TLO. I plan on running TLO on my next grow. I'm starting the cooking process in a couple weeks. If you have any added info on my transition to TLO, it would be much appreciated. So can you guys first tell people what TLO is and then, uh, Someone want to take that? I, well, I'd assume he's talking about true living organics by the Rev. Um, and in my opinion, um, 
Leighton can go deeper into this, but um, I feel like that is uh, living soil light or almost there living soil. Um, the Rev still talks about adding nutrition spikes. Um, there's not really so much a focus on building the microbial world and, and the diversity that, that I feel like is kind of the key to success for farming with a living soil. Uh, but it's definitely, um, I, I gave some talks uh, before where I was talking about the, pr the progress of learning about this. And I would say that, you know, on the, the fourth or fifth ladder, uh, that is where the rev would be. But then I would continue to educate myself past that with uh, a bunch of uh, education out there where you're actually building the microbial world. Okay, so yeah. so getting from where this where Derek currently is to where he where you guys think uh, you know the, the the rev is part way up the ladder, but then to keep going, kind of, can you give him some advice on migrating down that path? Rachel, you want to take that uh, diversity, Protect. diversity, diversity? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, echoed, echoed, echoed. Yes, that is the key to success and the way to protect protect your plant in a way. And, and knowing, putting your farmer brain on and, and improving on Mother Nature in certain areas, um, so that you can combat uh, a lot of issues by just improving the overall health of the cannabis plant herself. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, there's no time like the present. Um, if you're new to, to living organic soil or, you know, working in this type of way, I know <clears throat> that for me, the first thing to do is really just start doing it. And we learn a lot through making mistakes. <clears throat> and there's also a lot of experts out there who we can refer to and connect with as well. So, you know, now is the time. Oh, man, and there's no such thing as mistakes, only lessons. Right, yeah. Rachel? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people uh, so that... Yeah, uh, I mean, as far as... Yeah, yeah so uh, trying to, trying to uh, like, uh, encourage him to take it to the next level, I would say that, you know, probably the best thing to do is, is um, start to really understand what compost is, right? things well compost can be you know it's just like you know organic matter well no um i worked on a farm recently teaching uh, 20 year old kids in malibu believe it or not <laughs> compost right i i didn't think i was going to have their attention but what i did to encourage them was to i said all right i want you to go out and get this five gallon compound bucket filled with just leaves just the tips of the leaves of as many different green plants as you can possibly find. And the guy that, or the, well, there were no girls, but I would have said guy or the girl comes back with the most diversity, the most different types of green plants, you win the day prize. And so everybody was out trying their hardest to out compete and out find things that the other people in the group did not have. That's, that's diversity. All right. That's one small way to, to increase your, your biodiversity and your compost, because there's going to be different organisms living on each one of those leaf surfaces that are different than the other leaf surfaces. Now, are they all going to come through at the end? Maybe, or maybe not. But I think if you start to look at, at biology as a succession, like you, you can't grow a redwood for a redwood tree in a swamp, they're different successions. And I think biology on many ways uh, is works in the same way exactly the same way it's it's just natural steps from one to the next to the next so there's often like uh yeast terrestrial yeast you will never get to true um saprophytic fungi unless you have had terrestrial yeasts first beginning to build that soil structure to accept the next level of organism so i think that's kind of the where you know you should focus on if you're trying to make these leaps from bottled nutrients into the next level of living soil yeah slow steps cool add some worms you know that's that's another great start um making your own compost is critical uh if 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 you have to buy it you have to buy it to start but that doesn't mean you just always buy it it's just the start and i i heard some crazy barking was that you brian sorry <laughs> Brian, you old dog, you. <laughs> Just play it on, Brian. 
<laughs> I was muted, buddy. <laughs> yeah, so this is fun. I hope. Um, I. Oh, I just didn't want to discourage uh, re reading the Rev and everything. I just feel like um, that's kind of like old knowledge, in my opinion. It's something that if you want to take the time to read and understand and keep climbing the ladder, okay. But there's a lot of fantastic videos out there and just a lot of uh, just people in general now that we've covered and everything. There's, everybody's, um, you know, trying to put information out there. So uh, I think reading the reading the rev is uh, really up to you, but in my opinion, is a little bit dated. Hope I, I hope that's not offensive. <laughs> I'm not offended. <laughs> so what do you guys think about the nutrition spikes and stuff? Is that, I mean, I guess that's why I feel like it's not really something that I would personally uh, endorse. Um, other than if you're just trying to move away from synthetics and this is the, the bridge that you're taking towards uh, living soil. I would say just go for I think if you're living. making the spikes. Yeah, go full living soil. I know a lot of people do like recycled soil and then re-amend it each time, but you're still sort of breaking the loops in those cycles. And so um, just, you know, create your own living soil beds that you can create those cycles of perpetuity with. Yeah, and like what Rachel said earlier, go get some seaweed, go get some shells, you know, go collect stuff that's that's around you that are sources of nitrogen. Start to understand the C to N ratio of everything, whether it's a blood meal, uh, whether it's a feather meal, whether it's a corn stalk. Everything has a value value and every plant has all the nutrients that plant needed to grow in it so therefore in reality you can yeah you can get basalt dust or 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 mineral uh phosphate or whatever uh, rock phosphate but you don't need those because if you're composting high phosphate loving plants you're gonna have your phosphorus and and true with your nitrogen lovers if you're if you're growing a whole bunch of clover and you pull it up so you're getting all of those nodules, um, you've got a great source of nitrogen right there. Um, and now you compost that or, or press it and make an extract or, or make a ferment with it. There's your nutrient sources. So do you need to spike? I don't think so. I agree with, I agree with Brian. Um, and if you want to spike, make your own. There's no reason why you can't make every single one of the nutrients you need, whether you use the natural farming style, uh, biodiversity style, soil food web style, um, or super soil style. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with with transitioning. Um, I get it. It's it don't. I always tell people, don't jump off the bridge, man. Learn learn about this. Go low and slow, so that you are confident in in uh, your next step. And and don't do your whole garden. Just do a pot or a couple of pots to see how it works, you know, I mean, it, the watering is gonna be different, um, the plant reaction is gonna be different. And so in order for you to make that connection to this plant in this new sto style of growing um, requires time and experience. And if you, if you put the time in and you pay attention to the experience you're having, you're gonna transition a lot easier than like what Brian went through. I mean, Brian and I laugh about, you know, when he first got into this and the struggles of getting off nutrients and into living soils, was not easy, but the people that are listening to these kinds of conversations and like the conference we just put on, you're going to avoid making, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of mistakes that, that people before you learned the hard way, um, in order for them to get to where they are. So, you know, I don't want to say ride on our coattails, but definitely like, listen to, listen to the wisdom of the experiences that we've had so that you don't have to repeat those kinds of, uh, lessons. So uh, we got a whole lot of questions. So let me, um, some of them were from a long time ago and I got uh, some construction outside, but uh, Leighton, you, you use the microscope, right? I'm sorry, say it again. I said you, you are a fan of the microscope. Do I use a microscope? Yes, I, I, I live behind a microscope for the most part. Okay, so for um, that's the only so for someone who's the way new, I can see. Go ahead. 
So, so for someone who's new with a microscope, uh, kind of what are some of the first things that you train a, a, someone who's new to the microscope to start looking for and being able to identify and why it's important? What, what, when they're looking at like a oh, soil, a sand, like a, their uh, own soil. No, that's a, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll start it with a little story I had. Um, so when I first met Dr. Elaine, I came down with a vial of my fish frass that I had stabilized. And I'm like, Elaine, I know this stuff works great with plants. Like I've seen the plant reaction, but I want to know why it works. And she's like, well, in order for me to uh, explain that to you, you're going to need to learn to use a microscope so that you can understand what's happening at a, on a cellular or microbiological level. And so she goes, all right, go up to the microscope room. There's seven of my a protege up there and, and, you know, have them show you how to use the microscope. So, you know, me, I'm an old timer. There's all these, you know, kids, <laughs> 18, 20 year olds. And they're looking at me like, oh man, who's this old guy? Right. And I'm sitting down. I'm like, Hey, can one of you just show me how to like set this up? And it started with that. Like, all right, how do I set up a slide? How do I, how do I set the stage? How do I focus? And so from that point on, I, I figured out how to use the instrument. And then I was just sitting there looking at stuff going, what am I looking at? I'm like, I'm so overwhelmed. There's so much going on in here. And, you know, where do I even start? And so I would look around, you know, bewildered and, and the kids would be laughing at me. And I'm like, you know, can you guys look, give me a hint as to where I should start? And they're like, well, start with anything that's moving. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I start zooming around with a slide until I found something moving. Then I studied that for a while and, and I repeated and I repeated and I repeated. And then I started to see differences in moving things. And I tried to associate shapes now. And then once I started to get shapes, then I started looking, you know, under 800 power to all the different shapes of the bacteria that were vibrating around. So now I knew that, you know, the, the littlest guys were bacteria. And these bigger guys that were moving around were protozoa. Now, not all protozoas move. The, the testate amoebas do not move. But you guys have the internet, man. I mean, you have the power of like Googling uh, pictures of what the organisms look like on the soil, in the soil food web. So between that and a microscope, you know, just sitting there looking at your computer screen of different organisms and then trying to find them in your compost is a great way to start. Now. The biggest problem you have is you probably don't have a good representative uh, for your microscope slide. Like you don't have a really rich, good compost that's going to have all these organisms in it. Um, that gets a little bit complicated. So that's where you need to get a real inoculant, not, not bugs in a jug, um, but something that's going to have nematodes or something that's going to have protozoa. Um, I I can go on and on about that at length, but I'm not going to, uh, but hit me up on IG and I can give you some, some, uh, places and resources, whether I ship you a little, you know, handful of the stuff myself or you can get it online or maybe your local extension. Um, uh, but we'll figure out ways to get you some representatives of what you're really looking for. But if you start with, if you start with a Google search of the soil food web characters, and then try to find them under your microscope. And again, start with things that are moving. And then work to things that are still that are not moving and uh, you'll get it it just takes time it's just experience i hope i answered the question <laughs> it was a good answer uh so this just popped up uh dark walker did some hugel beds outdoors this year worst issue was overwatering root rot during flowering all my fabric pots were fine glad i still did some fabric pots uh all right, so that dude missed the point. The whole concept behind Hugo culture is that you bury rotten logs that hold moisture, and then you don't do anything at all. I mean, Hugo culture was these guys, they were nomads. They lived six months in one part of uh, Europe and six months in the other part. So during the summer, they were up north. During the winter, they were down south. And what would they do? was when they were gearing up to leave, they would build these mounds. They'd bury the logs. They didn't bury them. They kind of like a little bit dug in. And then they took all the soil from what that little pit they dug and 
threw it on top and then they planted it with things that they were going to want when they got back six months later who watered that nobody so don't ever water your hugo pile you don't need to the whole goal is to get that equilibrium to happen between a wet rotten log to releasing the moisture back into the soil system just like i talk about in soil horizons the, that log is essentially the horizon it's going to pull in excess moisture when it rains and store it and then release it slowly back during periods of rot. So don't water your hugo piles. <laughs> I think that's great, you know, seeing that perspective of permaculture coming back to it all depends, right? Because he was comparing hugo culture to his pots. Um, and the pots, for example, you know, need that water and that system that you're creating, whereas just like you said, Layton, the whole point of hugo culture is to have a water supply from the ground up. Talk about uh, saving some time. Things. Right. I mean, <laughs> there's so many little Those nuggets. guys weren't fools. Did you <laughs> see that question, Layton? So no blue mats in your yoga bed. <laughs> no, 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 hang on on the blue mats, buddy. Save those for your fabric pots. <laughs> very very limited rain well i mean yeah look the goal the goal again is to start with a soaking wet rotten log all right so anyone who's been out in the woods and, and had a rotten log and grabbed it and squeezed it you can get moisture out of it so if you're starting with a rotten log that you squeeze and it does not release some moisture then in that situation yes you can go ahead and water it in so that it's it's water logged no no pun intended right and then bury it with soil so if you're in a very arid area, then you still will have rotten logs, but they won't be saturated. They won't be waterlogged. So in that case, yeah, you can go ahead and water it um, until it's starting to hold moisture and then throw your dry soil on top of it. Well said, sir. Peter, do you have other questions? So. Yes. Uh, so a long time ago, and th th this is actually very timely and relevant, um, kind of raised beds, uh, over the winter, you know, the season's over. I mean, Rachel, you're in Maine now. So like, and, and actually blue of green tank, uh, was talking about this a while ago and wanted to talk about it. But so Tandoori farm, uh, like an hour and a half ago, said I finished my harvest and then covered my bed in hay and dirt. Is that a good start for the winter to start a no-till bed? So kind of what are some strategies for keeping your soil, you know, the microbes humming and keeping things going for the spring season? So it's called part... putting him to bed for the winter. Sorry, yeah, Rachel, have... go ahead, go first. Oh, I'm just going to say, yeah, it's, um, if you're having a raised bed, it's nice to put some type of either cover crop or um, mulching over like hay is great. And, you know, I was living up at 9,000 feet in Colorado and yeah, I would have that same living soil pot outside through the winter and then use it again the next season. And so that's a great way to do that. If you have um, fields you're growing in, you can sow other types of winter crops in. I think some like farmers are using rye or barley, you know, different winter crops that you can use or doing practices of biodynamic like uh, crop rotation. Um, so I would have one bin like this that you might grow cannabis in, but then maybe you're growing other types of crops in it um, throughout the year as well. so i'm a big fan of leaves uh in new england we always have a tremendous amount of excess deciduous leaves they, they work wonderful in the essence that they'll they'll both provide a um, insulation layer for your raised beds um, and also as the snow falls and it compacts down it creates a nice uh, high carbon source of food for the organisms to munch on during the winter months um, so they'll be ready to pop out in spring and um, an interesting uh, story i shared with Lane, or she shared with me i should say 
Um, and she was early on in starting to move out of marine biology and into soil biology. She did a study up in uh, Montana where she went out every week for the entire winter, uh, trudged through three feet of snow to dig down to the layer where the soil actually met um, the, the snow. So she wanted to find out what was going on at that interface. And ironically enough, it was water. She found a liquid layer, always found a liquid layer between the bottom of the snow and the top of the soil. And when she took samples of that and she brought it back and microscoped it, it was teeming with microbes. So there's this interface that happens between those two that that is again kind of um, not definable. I mean, you would think that the frozen ground would meet frozen snow and there would be no liquid layer, but in reality, there was a liquid layer. You might attribute it to the high biological level that was existing that kind of refused to go to sleep um, and through its kinetic energy maintained a, uh, uh, a liquid stasis um, between the two. But, you know, some of the other studies that I've uh, been part of or read about as far as looking at um, that soil in a forest system under leaves, under a tremendous amount of snow, really doesn't freeze 100%. You'll get ice crystals but it's not like it freezes like bare ground in Massachusetts on your backyard. I mean, that that's concrete. You need a backhoe to peel that up, but that doesn't happen in nature in, in, in prairies or in, you know, old growth forests or even, even just serious forests. Um, so leaves, I'm a big fan of them. They just, they provide, they help shed water and provide that insulation layer, that carbon source of food for the, for the microbes during the winter months. Um, and if you want to add some hay or straw, that's another great, you know, fungal food, bacterial food that, that'll help you get get your soil transitioned and ready for spring so that when when the snow melts and the ground thaws, you'll be you'll be off to the races with some great organic matter to start with. And Leighton, I don't know if you can speak more to this, but I was recently reading about uh, the melting polar ice caps and how there was some certain microbiology that they had never seen before that was suspended within the ice and just starting to um, that was melting of course and awakening after i don't know millions of years um, those microbes have been suspended in life and uh, are now being released and people are saying 2020 is not the year for that but i don't know if you've heard about that or uh, about those microbes Oh, God, girl. Yeah, I've been deep down this rabbit hole for a long time. Um, so the peat, the peat bogs, the permafrost melting, they found a number of super viruses uh, that are that are actually coming back to life because the permafrost is melting. Um, there's core samples that they did that date back hundreds of thousands of years that as they let that core melt, the microbes come right back to life. Uh, we know tardigras can, or water bears, live in space with with no atmosphere, no heat, uh, exposed to incredible radiation. Um, there was just a study done on on some bacteria that lived outside the space shuttle uh, or a space station that they were they were placed out there three years ago, um, and they scraped them off. And sure as shit, underneath the biofilm, they were still living, and they'd been exposed to pure space for three years. So we know these organisms are incredibly resilient. They live, they live at the bottom of uh, volcanic vents at the bottom of the ocean. Um, I'm actually in the middle of reading a paper uh, that's talking about uh, rock as uh, has the ability to perform primordial soup, which is the most important ingredients to cellular or bacterial life. And so there's still this huge Today, whether bacteria came from space, panspermia, or whether actually bacteria came from, uh, you know, these biological consequences between <clears throat> rocks breaking down and creating the primordial soup, and then perhaps electricity, like a lightning strike or uh, some extreme event um, that created that, that transition from primordial soup to the first bacteria. But no, there's, they're way, way more resilient than us. Uh, another really one that's mind bending is that the bacteria that live um, on the bottom of the ocean, they brought them up and they put them in agar plates and tried to grow them out. 
Well, what they quickly realized was, was the metabolism of this particular bacteria was something like 10,000 years before it actually divided. So talk about living in a different time scale. 10,000 years before that bacteria will actually split and have another one. And so how long have they been living down there, right? Millions and millions of years. They just live on a different time scale. See, we, we, we humans are so arrogant and they think that, well, because I'm only here for 80 years, you know, everything has to happen right now. Wow. Well, nature doesn't work that way. She's been around for 4 billion years and, and probably another 4 billion before the sun expands, and gets all crazy and <laughs> red giants and wipes everything out. But yeah, you know, life, life is, especially on the biological level is, is pretty deep and interesting. And, and, you know, we are, we are naive to think that we uh, really understand it at this point in time. Well said, brother. Um, <laughs> when you have too much carbon, uh, what can, can you talk about kind of what happens when you're, when you're way too heavy on the carbon side and, and how to kind of rectify that? Uh, is that me you're asking that Peter? Whoever. <laughs> All right. I'll <laughs> I'll jump in on that one. Um, so I did, I did some work early on with a company called Pit Moss. And Pit Moss was taking recycled newspapers and cardboard boxes um, and trying to come up with a PET alternative. And Rachel, please don't use PET anymore. Use Pit Moss, all right? <laughs> um, anyway, so I was working with the Phipps Conservatory. They were trying to get into a more uh, organic uh uh, growing system, growing medium. And so Mott Hadley was brought in to provide the alternative substrate. Um, I was brought in to bring in the biology. <clears throat> and then we worked with, with their plant pathologist or their greenhouse manager to to start growing out these plants for their displays. And so we used uh, pit moss with conventional fertilizers, pit moss with conventional fertilizers and biology and pit moss with just biology. And what happened was um, in that extremely carbon rich um, environment, the bacteria in just the biological system um, did not have an association with the plant. In other words, the bacteria just set up shop on the newspaper and wasn't inter interested at all in, in cycling for, for the plant. So in their eyes, it was a failure. In my eyes, it was like a really good experience, a real eye opener to the fact of what does it mean to have too much carbon in the soil? Um, I always warn people that are using biochar, that's a one shot app, man. And don't ever repeat that. I mean, if you continuously add more biochar to your soil and you get over 20% and I'm, I'm more conservative, I'd say anything over 15%, you're getting into trouble. Um, the biology will just set up camp on the, on that carbon source and just keep consuming it and uh, not have an association with plants and not, not be interested in working with them. Um, so you'll see this a lot in, in, in the beginnings after a, a forest fire rolls through that there's there's this shakeout period where um, you do not get uh, that kind of rapid growth that you would uh, under normal circumstances as that carbon is slowly broken down. I mean, forest fires are critical to hitting reset in nature. Um, it's just, unfortunately, the human's uh, practices have prevented those from happening because we're we've developed everywhere. So normally you'd have a wildfire tear through and you'd have a reset. And then all of those seeds buried down in the soil would eventually come back out. And that carbon that was on the surface layer will help provide um, the expansion of bacteria and then the expansion of the, the biological system only to the point where then when it starts to run out now, now it has no choice but to associate with the plant. So by, you know, artificially, adding too much carbon into the soil is a huge problem. If you've done that in a raised bed, dude, tear it apart, start over again, because you're, it's going to take thousands of years for that carbon to get broken down naturally and for that uh, association to take place again. Because remember, when a forest fire hits, it's not burying carbon down in the soil. It's all right on the very surface. Hope I answered that one. So, so actually, part of the reason I, I wanted to bring that up was someone had mentioned uh, carbon in the chat, but then that reminded me I was talking to Ashley from Pit Moss uh, yesterday or the day before, 
and she was talking about how you know it's like things to look out for as you're using this as a as a first timer and she was talking about not using uh urea based uh nitrogen sources can you talk about kind of different types of nitrogen sources and uh why one may oh boy uh, okay all right so you have two types of nitrogen fertilizers uh, ammonia uh, and uh, nitrite or nitrates so ammonia is going to have a different um, breakdown metabolism than the nitrate all right so in a in a bacterial system uh, bacteria will have to consume carbon to break down that nh uh, plus four to plant available so uh, in way back when in my original uh, introductions from coming out of Rodale into the real world, I was forced to work on these what's called uh, engineered soil systems. So high performance uh, sports graph, sports turf, you know, football, baseball, golf, all of them. And they would engineer these soil systems so that they didn't compact and people could walk on them. And if it was raining, you didn't get all muddy and sink into the ground um, and they would drain. So they would start with 10 percent organic matter, 90 percent soil. And then they would fertilize it. And if they were using ammonia base, what would happen was that their their organic matter, soil organic matter, would go down to one, if not even zero, um, very quickly because the bacteria had to consume a carbon source in order to break down that ammonia and make it unavailable. Now, in when you get into the nitrate size side of this, um, now you need water. So that cell needs extra moisture, extra water to break down that nitrate and make it available for the plant. So you're either going to burn a ton of water or you're going to burn a ton of carbon. So in the case of pit moss, which is heavy carbon, um, if you if you start using a ton of uh, ammonia based fertilizers, first of all, a lot of it's going to get soaked up into the into the uh, matrix itself. But you're going to be you're going to basically be losing a tr tremendous amount of the, the volume of that soil as that conversion is taking place. Um, that's why I really love the, the pit moss with core. I think it's called Cocoa Complete. Um, not only do they have a wonderful source of clean uh, coconut fiber, uh, the fiber is handled appropriately so it's not compacted or crushed, but it also provides a real helpful uh, soil structure that is a, a kind of carbon source that's a lot harder for the microbes to break down and uh, therefore it's not going to uh, compact and it's not going to require you continues to add more to it. So again, the, the, you got to look at whether it's an ammonia or a nitrate and then understand that the bacteria is either going to consume carbon to, to break the nitrate, uh, to break the ammonia down or water to break the nitrate down. I, I hope that it helped answer that question. Uh, we got a, is everybody who is here for living soil conversations happy now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so when, when, when do we get back to the spirituality, man? I, I finally, you know, I get to meet, meet Rachel. And, and when I opened my presentation on Saturday, the first thing I did was talk about psychical soil and how, you know, we really need to think about soil on another level. And so here's someone that I would love to hear her thoughts on that one. We have a we have a dog interruption. The dog just wants to be a part of the show. <laughs> he does. This is Phil. Um, and his hair also makes a good uh, mulching. <laughs> we return every part back to the soil. Yeah, and I was I think I was muted, but I was saying I really appreciated that part of your presentation and you starting off uh, speaking about the spirit of the soil in sort of that psychical sense of it. Yeah, I think we've lost that. You know, I think that's one of our another big disconnects is that we don't play with the mud and we don't, you know, we don't get dirt under our fingernails and we use these freaking antibacterial soaps and, you know, all this insanity. And, and so, you know, the indigenous understood that connection. They worship Mother Earth. They worship the turtle world and Gaia. And we completely disrespected it and we have totally disassociated from it. So, you know, again, I think that, you know, Rachel, you, you bring this 
question or not question, but this concept back into people's minds. I think that it's a really important one. I mean, if you're going to be into living soils, you better be connected to those. If you're not, if you're not spiritually connected to them, then you're not going to get the kind of results that you potentially could have if you were, if you were more connected and, and meditated with it and kept your hands buried in it and, and, you know, did all the things that we talked about today, breathing with it and the plant. So can, can you, you know, speak a little bit more on that side of it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I would say the biggest thing, like the biggest mis misperception within the cannabis industry and people I've spoken with is that they say it's not a scalable model. Living soil is not scalable. But to me, that's so funny because the whole entire earth is living soil. Um, and so, <laughs> <laughs> scalable model. This is, you know, the planet's been doing it for thousands of years and on a huge model. So um, to say it's not scalable is really just unrealistic. Um, it's just having having the knowledge of how to model nature. And so the more we can, the first principle of permaculture is observe before you interact. Like for the person watering their hugel culture bed, were you observing the bed before every time you're watering it? Or is it just you're on an automated system, you think, okay, at this time, every day, I'm going to water. Um, but the whole reason we have an intimate relationship with the plants and with the soil is so that we can give it what they need and they give us what we need. This is what a reciprocal relationship is. And so, you know, before watering plants, just take some time to observe them. Uh, you know, how are the leaves looking? Are they getting droopy? Are they praying to the lights? Um, or are you outside? Uh, you know, put your hands in the soil, actually feel it. You know, does it feel wet? Does it feel dry? And you know, put your finger down even further to see the different levels of soil. Um, I was talking to a local farmer out here who said he was doing soil testing and he tested different parts of his fields and even tested two, um, two parts right next to each other and every single test presented a different microbial profile just within one acre into you know one square foot, one edge of the square foot and the other edge of the square foot, completely different profiles. And so, you know, it's so important that we build these spiritual relationships to our plants so that we can grow the most healthy plants possible. Um, I think a lot of times people hear about a concept, um, I think I had talked with Brian about this before with someone who um, read about ladybugs in your system. So ladybugs eat aphids, for example. But if you don't have, if you have a stable ecosystem and you don't have any pests, then there's no need to introduce something else into the system. Um, so with that particular person, the ladybugs ended up not having a food source and they ended up falling into the ventilation system and clogging up the ventilation system because they weren't they didn't need to be introduced and so when we think about living soil um, let's see ourselves as a part of this cycle and really understand each of the cycles that we're working with um, and how they said oh well what if i live in a really dry climate should i water my hugel culture bed Maybe, yeah, because you are living in an arid place that is having less water or, you know, what elevation are you at? That's going to affect your garden, whether it's um, indoor or outdoor. Uh, and, you know, that's even beyond my current comprehension of understanding rates of oxygen and how that works, depending on what elevation you're at in the world. Um, and, you know, everything from your humidity to your the cleanliness of your garden. Most gardens just really need a good cleaning and that would prevent any press, pest problems coming in there. But it really just all starts with us. Um, and you know, if we're centered and if we're in a place of calmness and balance, when we go into our gardens, we'll say, oh, well, let me observe the soil. Is it dry? Is it wet? Let me observe the plant. Just take time. So much of us just want to have everything automated or um, on a camera, so I don't even have to go in there. I don't. Some people were bragging to me, you know, I don't go into my garden for days. But for me, um, I feel like that's a disservice to the plants 
because you know as we start to work with living soil you'll see that it's it's a lot easier than some of the other bottled nutrient practices out there and feeding schedules and you know it's really a practice of of a do nothing farming because you're letting nature do the work for you um so my greatest advice is to just go out in nature and observe take your time um, watch how look at the ground and see what is happening um look up to the sky there's a whole native american meditation called the sky meditation where you just stare at the sky for 20 minutes and they say there's so much wisdom that is downloaded upon you um you know, in permaculture, they say to observe your land for at least a year. So you can observe the land through every season. You can see how the water flows, you know, what are the weed patterns, what are the weather patterns throughout the year before you plan your garden. And so we just really need to take the time. Um, Lao Tzu says in nature, there is no hurry uh, and yet everything is accomplished. And so if we model, you know, not just our soil systems, but ourselves, if we model that of nature, then we can find uh, success and balance. Aho. <laughs> Absolutely. So let me, uh, we're in kind of like the bonus round wrap. Should we just do some rapid fire questions? Um, so sure. actually I'm going to give the, so hold on. Cause there were some that were, uh, kind of similar. Um, give me one second. So Rachel, how long so, did you spend down in Peru? Um, I've been down there. I'm oh, sorry, Peter. Go ahead. Um, I've been down there were a couple you, different times. Were you up? What's that? Were, were, you up at, were you up in the Ayacucho area or were you down a little bit further south? Um, so I usually, I've always been to the same exact spot the time that I go. So the first time I met, I was in college. I spent a whole semester down there doing a research program. Um, and I, with the Shipibo tribe, so that was north of the Quitos of the Rio Napo, which is a tributary off of the um, Amazon River. So you usually fly to Lima and then fly to Iquitos, and then it's like a two hour boat ride north um, off the Amazon River. And then that's where I stay in the village. And usually when I go down there, it's for like a month or so. Nice, nice. Now, when I was growing up and when I went down there, um, Iquitos was the, uh, was the place of a revolution called the, uh, was it the red, the red something, um, a shining path. I think it was the shining path. Now that's all calmed down, right? There's no crazy people killing each other anymore down there. Right. I mean, the thing <laughs> That's happening everywhere, but also, yeah, you got to be really careful. Um, <clears throat> you're in the middle of the jungle, and there's you know lots of signs around about avoiding sex trafficking, human trafficking. There's you know lots of things happening down in the jungle. So you know, for me personally, being female, anytime I travel, I I have personally never traveled alone, unfortunately. And I always travel with weapons. So <clears throat> I always have people around me that have AK 47s at all times. So when, you know, when you're working in the spirit world, you need someone to protect your physical body because I'm, you know, way out there as, as Brian calls it blasting off. So our ego actually is what protects us. So if we're so far detached from our ego, then who's going to protect you and your body so i do think it's really important to you know have what some people call a trip sitter um or a shaman or a curandera or someone who's protecting you and working with you when you work with these plant medicines because they bring you to such a cosmic place um so it's always important you know for myself when i go i make sure that i have people with me and around me and we're always protected and you know, for anyone who is looking to experiment with psychedelic medicine, it's always nice to have a, a person there who's experienced 
who can sort of guide you through it um, because you, you may get lost. And so it's nice to have some type of anchor to bring you back. Um, but it's been interesting too with ayahuasca tourism because just like as we saw with the mushroom world with Maria Sabina, um, and if anyone's not familiar with her story, I'll, I'll quickly tell it, but she was the woman <clears throat> out of Mexico who had shared the mushroom medicine against her her village's wishes with um, actually people from an MK Ultra program from the US government who went down there to basically steal her mushroom medicine and they published uh, without her consent, her photo and her village and her location in uh, it was Life Magazine. And from that publication, in the, what was it, late 50s, early 60s? And, and Leighton, maybe you um, know more about that specific incidents with that publication, but that led a whole trial, a whole trail of, of Westerners to Mexico to seeking to speak with God or seeking their higher self. Um, and it really took down Maria Sabina and eventually um, her village excommunicated her, they murdered her son. Um, and she just saw such turmoil from wanting to share the medicine with the people. She was trying to you know, share this medicine and the people really destroyed it. Uh, you know, some of the people that went down included musicians that changed our lifetime, like Bob Dylan, John Lennon. Um, and not to say that they were the particular ones that were destroying the village, but we see the same thing today with ayahuasca medicine. And so, you know, a lot of people will bring ayahuasca here to the States and hold ceremony, um, or some people may drink a couple times and then think that they're a shaman and that they're ready to hold ceremony. And I'll tell you right now, I've been drinking with the medicine for, you know, over 10 years and I still need further training for ceremony because a lot of these curanderas that are working with the plant medicine, they, it's a lineage. So their grandparents, their great grandparents have um, worked with the ayahuasca as ayahuascaro to hold the wisdom of the medicine and pass it down to them. And they'll actually start around age seven. Um, if you look at our brain structure, and our skull, it starts to fuse together at age seven. So they say it's sort of when you become your character. So anything that's happened into your life from age zero to seven will set in and, and be sutured into you. So they'll invite the children around age seven to start training and learning how to work with this plant medicine. Well, sorry. That was really, that. yeah, that's right. That was really well said. And it's kind of like, you know, Oh, yeah, this has been repeated over and over again through all kinds of indigenous people across the, the world. And it's sad. And it's kind of like, you know, and I bet you totally get this, Rachel. Like when you went through yoga training, you didn't go to a weekend freaking seminar and all of a sudden come out with a certificate, right? You, you went through training, right? And and it's it's this, this instant gratification that humanity has got to get away from. And you're absolutely right. I mean, if you're not if you're not drink uh, doing ceremony with someone who has been a lifetime um, plant trainee, then you're crazy. You're supporting an industry that is is potentially devastating this really special place and bringing a lot of bad uh, bad characters and and decimation to a, something that should be so reveled and protected, um, but it isn't because of money and power and ego. And it's sad, but it's it's unfortunately the fact. But I'm sorry, Peter. You, do, do you want to have a questions or did you yeah, have some? Yeah, lined yeah, up? So, so so I want I want to do the home stretch of just some some of the audience questions. Uh, and a this one's coming in from Australia. He's been patiently waiting, and uh, hopefully he will uh, share some very good news uh maybe with the community or at least with me very shortly i'm not going to say what it is but uh he may have some good news on hand this is from riley in australia this is uh is it okay to add white vinegar to my water to lower the ph slightly i read it will kill the microbes in the soil is that true 
Uh, no, that's not true. And hey, I don't know where you are in Australia, but I had the opportunity to travel from pretty much Perth, Calgary, uh, Brisbane, uh, Hamilton Islands. I love, I love your state or your country, man. It's beautiful down there. But no, anything in low doses is not going to kill um, any uh, any kind of your microbes. If anything, it may change the diversity a little bit, but that's okay. It's again, everything is in succession. Just don't overdo it. Don't overdo anything. Like I say, don't be a moron. Just a little bit. Try it. See what happens. Hope that helped. And he's in the Byron Bay area. Oh, I never got over there but cool <laughs> maybe my next drunk so there i think there are a bunch of kind of dry amendment questions so can you guys talk about uh i guess i mean i'll, I'll start looking through the questions but i remember uh there are a bunch of people talking about just different dry amendments and what you mix in as you're building your soils up if anything well, and let me I mean, some people. dry amendments are dry mute, dry amendments are great. But if you don't have biology, you're, you're, you're not doing anything. I mean, that's always been the biggest problem with organic fertilizers. You know, these people, oh, I use organic fertilizers. They don't work. And I'm like, well, yeah, you know why? It's because you've been using synthetics for all these years. You have no, you know, biological life in your soil other than a little bit of bacteria. So of course these bio, uh, these organic amendments aren't going to work. You have to have really, really healthy soil food. Web. I mean, what is going to eat the, you know, the, uh, the calcium carbonate off the shelf? What, what's going to break that apart? It's not, it's not nature, it's biology. So all of these dry amendments um, are great, but if you don't have a really healthy living soil system, and I mean a complete soil food web, they're not going to do you any good. They're just going to be building up and, and, Again, I'm all about soil chemistry, like understanding what it is you're starting with. Find zero point and then decide, okay, I'm low on this or I'm high on that. And then run a cultivar because each cultivar is going to pull different things from that soil system. So if you're not testing before you run and after you run, how do you know how to amend? It's like going to the doctor and saying, hey, doc, I don't feel well. Oh, just eat this pill and you'll be fine. No, he's going to run you through blood tests, you know, all kinds of tests to see what is the problem so if you're not testing your soil how do you know where you even are starting and that's true with with the you know the the bio if you're not sending it off to a soil food web then you don't know if you have good compost you don't know if you have a good soil food web in your in your containers or your raised beds you don't know anything and so you're making a lot of assumptions and in that regard dry amendments are great but again without something to break it down and make it plan available you're spinning your wheels and you're just building stuff up so, so let's say you do have the microbes humming what kind of uh dry amendments have you used or do you see people using effectively uh i would say which dry amendments have i not used yet so they just collected some some stardust from an asteroid that, that should be back in another two and a half years. Can't wait to try that one. Wow. <laughs> oh, have you heard about that, Rachel? No, I, I, I want to learn more. <sighs> oh, man. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. The U.S. finally, I, uh, Japan has done it. It didn't work out so well. China did it, and it didn't work out so well. Um, but we finally landed a... Uh, um, a device on, on an asteroid and we're able to suck up rocks and soil uh to a point where we had a decent collection it, it at first it started leaking a little i think there was a pebble stuck in the in the door that closed but, but they figured that out and so it's safely on the way back uh should be here in another i think two two and a half years but that's going to be really interesting because that goes along the idea or the understanding of was it panspermia panspermia theory is basically that life the first bacteria on this planet came from an asteroid or a comet and that's what started everything and now we 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 know that we had primordial soup and so primordial soup is basically all of the foods um, that a cell would need to be able to survive and reproduce but we didn't have life so that's always been the question was it the god particle well did an alien fly by and empty their toilet uh, or did it come from an asteroid or another life source somewhere else on the planet? 
or in the in the galaxy and so anyway yeah that's probably pretty much the only dry ingredient i haven't played with yet because <laughs> i've tried pretty much everything and, and again you know all of these things have value i mean whether it's the salt i mean the salt is the hardest rock on the planet all of our continents float on top of basalt so and i know a lot of ogs uh and a lot of super soils will use basalt dust in their in their mix in their super soils and yeah bacteria can break that stuff down and uh yeah i'll, I'll share some articles on on uh rocks and their value uh in in creating primordial soup i'll, I'll post something up later today in ig it's cool shit. so um so Perpetual wanted to know how to prepare compacted soil for next spring. And then also what cut yeah, basically what cover crops to help break soil up. Daikon radishes. They're called the jackhammer radish for a reason. You plant them, let them go. Don't pull them up. They're, they're going to be a little stinky, <clears throat> but they're going to provide a tremendous amount of food for the, the microbes in the soil and humic acid, a really, really good humic acid. Uh, Bioag would be the one I recommend. Um, will help with compaction and start building soil structure. Okay, we have... And, uh, and having Rachel bless them. <laughs> uh, when does silica and vermiculite become bioavailable? Oh, boy. Uh, vermiculite is not one of my favorite um, things to be playing around with because it floats to the soil oil surface uh, how long will it take to break down i don't know but i'd much rather you guys be playing with sand i mean sand is two three one of three things it's either silica based on a quartz breakdown which again now you have one silica atom and two oxygen atoms real simple easy to break apart um, another great source is um, well there's all kinds of plants you can ferment and get uh, bioavailable or plant available silica sources that way um, and then there's also, you know, fossilized can, 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 shells. Can you give a couple of examples of plants? Uh, I think it's vetch is one. Um, there's a um, dragonfly talks about this all the time. Um, vetch, uh, it's one of the first plants. I think it's called horsetail. Yeah. Um, horse, come on, help me yeah. out here. Yeah, horsetail. And then there's, um, is it comfrey? There's one other one that they, they talk about it, as as the what is it? It's a Bocking comfrey. Uh, yeah. Okay. It. So there's a specific. Yeah. Comfrey. There's a couple sources. Yeah. Hit up. What about dragonfly. dandelion? They, 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 I don't think they're silica. I I know they have wonderful properties, med, medicinal properties actually that that are. Uh, provide a wonderful um, dandelion tea is, is should be a part of all of our uh, diets periodically just to boost our immune system. Uh, but Rachel, you could probably talk about dandelions a lot more than I can. Um, dandelions also have a, a deep tap root in there too. Uh, but yeah, they're great for the liver detoxifying the liver um, and great, great medicine. Someone also saying nettles, nettles are good for absorbing iron. I know for myself, I'm very anemic, so I try to drink a, a lot of nettle tea for the iron. And um, I'm a huge fan of neem um, as a soil amendment. And, you know, I brush my teeth with neem every single day. I know there's been some interesting papers, articles I've read about neem and azadiractin. Um, but again, just seeing how, you know, these different plants can can feed your microbiology there oh cover crops um <clears throat> brassicas crazy clover, ray big and a crazy ray <clears throat> <laughs> so there there was um, a question uh a question i had thrown up earlier let me just get back to it uh yeah i i actually yeah, just I, to speak <laughs> Actually, you know what? You go for it, Leighton. Yeah, no, that was the plan I was thinking about was the stinging nettle. So thank you for whoever that was that threw that up. Um, you know, that's that's an important thing to uh, take into consideration is if you want something that you can you can harvest locally, uh, ferment and then apply as 
they foliar to your plants, it's a great source. And then Rachel, you hit on something that I wanted to run with, and I forget what it was. <laughs> so, it's so, so actually, hard the question. When I mention neem. So je just quickly, while people are talking yes, daikon neem, radishes, neem. Oh. yet yesterday uh, we had hot pot, and I sent Brian pictures of the daikon I pulled out of the garden. Uh, so there it is in the hot pot, mm. and then uh, in uh, salad format. So that was last night's dinner is very satisfying nice yeah Go ahead. so so rachel there's been there's been this um uh, ongoing debate between some pretty uh pretty large uh instagram followers uh, about neem and the use of neem in in soil especially in uh, cannabis production and so half the people are like well neem is a biocide so it is we know that i mean that's why we brush our teeth with it it is a fungicide it's a bacteria side um, so it's pretty much a, considered a biocide. And so people want to use neem or neem cake a lot um, in these super soils as a insecticide or uh, for prevent uh, pathogens from breaking out in your soil system. And I've always been like on the fence with this. Like I'm not saying that a little bit here or there would be horrific because, again, I believe in diversity. But I'm, I also warn people about, you know, again, using too much. And that always seems to be the case is that someone finds something that's, oh, look how good this is. And, oh, let's put more on. Let's put more on. And, and then you have these problems where you crash your entire living soil system because you use too much neem. So I, I, I totally understand the medicinal properties of it. I mean, they've been using that tree for thousands of years down there in the Far East as, as a, a medicinal remedies. Um, but again, they're using them for, for specific things. They're not shotgunning with them. Um, so I don't know, can you speak any more on neem uh, from your experience? Um, well, I mostly experienced it for top dressing and then also veg, different foliar sprays, like you said, as an insecticide for IPM, integrated pest management. But absolutely, um, when you say, when you put more on and more on, what does that make us a moron? <laughs> so we, we definitely want to, you know, make sure that we work in small amounts and again, observe and interact and see how that works with our plants or our particular cultivars or the particular soil mix that we're making. And as you have been stressing lately and to really test the soil, we don't know what it needs or what would be most beneficial unless we really tested that to find out. And it is really cost effective too. Brian, you had yeah, something? I think uh, you're referring to Mr. Coots. Yeah, the right. Coot Scott scams. Uh... Battle Royale. So we have a uh, a question about using native clay soil and uh, the topsoil and the horizon. Uh, do you have to add sand? Uh, all right. So in the lecture I gave on Saturday, I talked about each of the components of, of soil. Um, so I want you to look at soil as um, only 50% physical or psychical. Uh, so that would be sand, silt, clay, and organic matter. And that's 50% of the puzzle. The other 50% 50 is water and air. So depending on how much water, how much air you have, you're either arid or you're anaerobic in your soil system. So <clears throat> to limit yourself to not having sand, silt, and clay, in my mind is, is you know, you're making a mistake. Um, the relationship between the amounts of sand, silt, and clay are critical. Uh, anybody that's grown in a very clay soil will tell you how the problems of, of water infiltration, compaction, gas exchange, uh, pest management, you know, pest pressure because of all of these uh, dysfunctional qualities of that soil system. And again, if they had taken that clay and, and hit it with daikon radishes and um, you know, other deep rooting uh, cover crops, you know, potatoes, anything that will get down there and bust up that compaction and get that soil back to functioning again, um, you're, you're missing the point. So I'm a big fan of native clay. I'm a big fan of native silt and native sand. So my recommendations is that go to Shaping Fire. Uh, I think it's episode 45. I talk about soil and soil horizons. Watch it. You'll get all the information you need about it. Um, there's a quick nine-minute clip on on his YouTube channel, so you can get a visual, uh, a little 
a little um, picture of the horizon so that when you're listening to it, you'll understand how it functions. But no, I'm a big fan of saying, you know, potting soil, it's okay. But if you're really trying to get to the ultimate living soil system, how can you not have sand, silt, and clay with your organic matter? Hope that answered it. All right, we're back. Um, anyone else have thoughts on that while I tee up? Uh... Yeah, Rachel, do you add any uh, other um, things? Into your <laughs> there we go. Bri Brian has. Let me unmute everyone. That, I was I was wondering why everyone was quiet. <laughs> <coughs> Oh, yeah, the other thing, you know, I don't think we've spoken about is some type of aeration or, you know, whether it's a pumice or a volcanic rock so that the microbes have a place to live and we can create uh, aeration within the soil. So I always think that's important to mention. Um, I know in my mix, I always like to have a base of around a third compost, a third, some type of aeration rock, um, and then a third of some type of sphagnum peat moss or pit moss or something of that sort. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian, were you going to chime in there? Um, no, you guys. Uh, we've been getting high over here a little bit, so I was, <laughs> it was hard to hear the question. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I was asking Rachel, did you, Rachel, do you add any sand or any clay into your, into your soils mediums or your super soils? Um, you know, I, I, I have experienced with different things, but not particularly with adding any type of native soils, like a clay, a, a clay or a sand in there. But as you speak about it, I mean, and we were talking about modeling nature, it makes so much sense to have all of those things present. Right. So but, you know, hopefully you'll get to chance down and be some type of sand, but it's, you know, you know, I'm not adding clay to that. So it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you know what the funnest part is, is actually, uh, you know, wildcrafting. Because you're out in nature, you're hiking along riverbeds, you're looking for pockets of sand, you're looking for pockets of silt, you're looking for clay veins. It can just be another great way of connecting with nature and, and really forest bathing. Or, or and you can do this right along the coast as well, like wherever a river or a stream hits the ocean. Oh, what a wonderful source of all kinds of um, beautiful raw forms of soil, you know, the, the, the essence of it all. Um, so again, getting back to that whole connection on a, on a deeper level, and it can be a lot of fun to, to, to actually, you know, take the time to collect these amendments, dry them out, blend them together, you know, whether you're blending them by hand or mixing them in a cement mixer, but you just get a lot of, you know, you get a greater connection to the soil and the pots. You have a fan club. There you go. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Love to you. <laughs> And so I do wanted to I do want to touch on that a little bit. So um, Dr. Landingham was actually talking about how with the rice IMO boxes, uh, she doesn't really see how that's going to be as successful. And I've personally um, felt that myself when we go out into the woods, we set up these IMO boxes that kind of take up about half of your day. Uh, you know, you go out, maybe put five or six of those out there in, in spots that you feel like uh, you have a trained eye for. And for the most part, at least in, in my experience, I'm getting about 10 to 20 percent of a success rate with that. Um, so going out in the woods, getting the yeah. getting that. Um, do you think using a different food source instead of that rice, uh, we would have a better success rate while we're out there enjoying nature? That way we want to go back there and not just see uh, basically a bunch of IMO boxes that have gotten knocked over and squirrels or whatever is uh, sat there and ate all of your uh, the, micro Je the microbes. Yeah. Just quickly, where, where is rice native to? I don't know. Japan, I don't know. Korea. Right. Now, my my, Japan, my only point Korea. is, is it, it, it'd be interesting to know what kind of what kind of native things you can use to replace rice. Is kind well, of she was important. mentioning like non-GMO corn, so I, I was wondering, Rachel. I don't if, if you heard any of that. Uh, that was something that really struck out. She was obviously firing as she usually does with a 
an almost overwhelming amount of knowledge, but that was one of those nuggets that stuck out that I'd never heard her say before. Yeah, I've heard her speak. I've listened to a lot of her podcasts um, of her disdain for KNF because where is it from? It's Korea natural farming. So what worked in Korea may not work here in the U.S. And so, you know, like Google culture beds, Google culture is what a German word. Um, yep. And so a lot of that's from Germany. And so where are we and, and where are you in the world? What's going to work for you? Uh, might not be what worked best somewhere else. So if you say corn, we have someone in Australia here listening, maybe um, that might not work well for them in their environment because that doesn't grow natively in Australia. So think about, you know, uh, I always like to talk to our elders too, to get information and education. And I know that I've done a lot of learning and studying and you know have certain certifications but I still feel like there's so much to learn we can always continue learning and adapting and under our understanding of the world is always changing and you know I even learned so much here with all of you today um, and so you know sometimes it would it would became popular and trendy to learn about a new way of farming like KNF but then also thinking about, okay, well, what are what are the indigenous roots to this? And we saw that work for them. Um, I know one of the first books I read from Masanobu Fukuoka was One Straw Revolution, um, that do nothing farming and making the rice balls. But he was in a different country where rice grows naturally. And that was one of their natural crops that we have that we don't have here. So, you know, I haven't personally experimented too much into that world. But when we think about what's good for our plants is also good for us. You know, we need to inoculate our bodies and make sure that we're eating fermented foods every single day. Um, you know, whether that be like a kimchi or a sauerkraut or, you know, you could pickle your daikon radishes that you're using to break up your compacted soil. So really think about like, OK, if I'm going to plant these radishes to break up the compacted soil, then can I then eat the radishes and incorporate them into my my life and into this cycle? Um, and I missed that one. Someone said about a sprouted seed tea. Um, so corn sprout tea. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, coconut water. Wonderful. Um, you know, I'll, I'll speak lightly on that. Um, yeah, Elaine, ever since uh, I first had that conversation with her about natural farming, um, which is the same as Korean natural farming, but only Americans call it Korean natural farming. Every The rest of the world calls it natural farming for whatever reason. But um, she was not a big proponent of it. She was kind of, and again, you have to remember that Elaine is a scientist and she has you know, letters behind her name that she's worked really hard to maintain. And so she's not going to step outside the box of show me the data, prove it to me. And so when I first heard her mention, well, hey, find another source of the rice that's more native. Well, you got to look at carbohydrates and you got to look at what that rice is actually providing. And I think that more importantly, you know, you're looking at this rice as a way to capture organisms um, and then store them so that you can grow them out later. And I don't know is that there is a better source for rice in that regard. And my first go round, which was the spring during lockdown of trying to do an IMO collection. Um, again, I have a, a ton of experience in nature, um, taking soil samples, bringing them back and looking at them. So I probably have an instinct that's that's far beyond a lot of people. Um, as far as walking into the forest, I can look around and see, hey, that's going to be a good collection spot, space. That's not. And and, spe and saying that, even I got fooled on a couple collection boxes where an animal did get in there. But of the six collection boxes I put out, I had four solid harvests. Because again, I was looking at nature. I was studying it. And that's going to be that's going to be a spiritual connection that, that you can't just put a finger on. But if you really are, are totally dialed in and focused, you should be able to feel or 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 have an intuitional guide as to where you're putting those boxes. But again, I don't know of another carbohydrate source that would provide a similar 
um, agar, our plates, uh, collection uh, element or, or material uh, to do the same thing. And, and, you know, I think that in many ways, rice is probably, um, let's, let's back this up for a minute. All right. So everyone's always worried about evasive species, right? Evasive species are coming They're you know, insects, fish, whatever, right? Humans have been traveling the globe since way, way back. And so for us to consider that rice was never brought from the Far East here would be foolish. And same with Europe. And that Hugo culture would never work in America, even though it worked in, in Germany, because all of this is, inter, is interconnected. And in many ways, it's not perfect. You're not going to grow a banana tree in, in the Antarctic. But if you had the right if you had the right controlled environment, you could. So, you know, let's let's look at a bigger picture and not try to like, you know, nitpick a certain thing. I mean, by all means, try steel cut oats, try, try some of these other carbohydrate sources. But in, in my experience, that rice was was amazing. It actually functioned really well. And that guy just popped up something about um, beer grains, spent grains, a huge fan of spent grains in your compost pile. Um, they're nematode food. Now, beer, beer, spent grains are a little bit on a more fungally uh, or antifungal uh, uh, grain. But if you go to uh, distilleries using alcohol spents, um, they're even better. They're, they're just fantastic. Um, I'm not sure if you could use them to collect IMO, um, but it's it's worthy of an experiment. Uh, maybe something I'll put on my, my agenda to play with uh, this fall. Sorry about the rant. <laughs> what about emulsifying, uh, like the other person, the viewer mentioned the blue corn and then using that instead of a, a as, is there enough of a um, sugar source in corn for that to take hold? Uh, I can't speak on that. I really don't know, to be honest. And again, there's, there's just, a, if you'd have to look at the rice itself and its properties to understand um, it's carbohydrate and sugar structure, um, because it's different and all of all carbohydrates are different. Um, that's why plants leak different, um, exudates, which are all carbon or, car, uh, excuse me, carbohydrates and sugars at different rates for different bacteria and different fungi. And so, you know, again, I think that we get, we, tr we try to, we try to like isolate things and boil them all down. And, and this is one of those things where, it's too big. It's too broad for us to just decide like, Hey, don't use rice, use this. Um, it, it's it, that's, we're limiting ourselves. We're trying to reduce something into something that's simple instead of just saying, Hey, let's look at what the rice actually is. Let's look at its complete like makeup and then try to find something that's indigenous to us. And my gut feeling is you're probably not going to find something um, that's that it, it might be close and it might work or maybe it won't, but it, without experimentation, it, it's, you know, it's all just chatter. And just one last, the bro science of what we've been working on these last two years, if it has all that rainbow, that's garbage, right? You got to start all over. No, <laughs> again, you guys, yeah, you, there's just way too much misinformation. I mean, I recommend that you go back and, and watch, Chris's original uh, release of what is IMO and you know another thing that he doesn't always touch on and you know kind of encouraged him to 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 make this more of a focus is what is IMO all right so if you collect in a meadow you're going to get different colors than if you collect in a forest and it depends on what tree that you're collecting under and remember you know like like Rachel said this is like a pin prick this is a tiny little dot in space and time as a representation of what we think is a whole. Well, if you went back and collected it a month later, it's going to be different. And six months later, a year, everything is going through succession. You're just trying to take a snapshot. So um, another piece that, that I, I keep trying to get Chris to, to really bang home in, in the understanding of IMO is that you're doing far more than collecting just saprophytic fungi. You're collecting yeasts, you're co or terrestrial yeasts. You're collecting terrestrial algaes. You, you might get a little bit of protozoa in that first collection, 
but you're certainly not going to get like heavy saprophytes. It's pretty much all going to be those yeasts and algaes, which are the are the beginnings of that succession toward saprophytic fungi. And I, you know, I'm blessed that I've got all this experience with the microscopes. I'm blessed that he's my friend and I can call him and talk to him about this stuff. And so when I went out and did my collections, the first thing I did was start like taking that colors and putting them in, in um, on microscope slides to see what I was looking at. What, why is it colorful? What is, what, why is, why am I seeing this expression? And at that point in time, it's really not clear. It's, it's more of a enzyme or a waste product of the biology that you caught or captured that's creating those colors. So to say a rainbow one is no good, well, you're telling me there's anything in nature that's bad. All of it needs to be here at some point or another. It's only when it gets out of control or out of balance, like Rachel talks about, it's all about balance. So if something gets out of balance, you got a problem. You're gonna get sick or you're, you're gonna have a, uh, a infestation of a pest or a predator or whatever. So, you know, going back to going back to the understanding that there's no such thing as a as a bad human or a good human. We're all just humans. It's just our expression that matters and, and our responsibility and our, our perhaps our love and our soul that, that makes us who we are or lack of soul in some cases. Right. But bottom line is, no, I don't think there's ever anything that's like a horrible collection if it's been done respectfully responsibly in undisturbed nature if you're if you're if you're doing a, a imo collection in your compost pile shame on you what you what are you collecting you're collecting what you already have the the whole goal of an imo collection is to collect something that is no longer present in your soil system because of the exposure to all the synthetics uh, acid rains fertilizers you know exhaust hydrocarbons so if you're if you're responsibly collecting an imo collection in a undisturbed soil system or as, as as old of an undisturbed soil system as possible because remember most most of this country has been disturbed at this point in time so finding those outlaying pockets is not easy but again if you're doing it responsibly what's a bad collection you know analyze that well said sir and uh, if we're collecting it and they're higher up, the microbes we're collecting are, you know, at 7,000 feet or, or lower, um, then those are, it's true that those would be a hardier uh, sample than if we were just going down to the base of that uh, same ecosystem. Yes, absolutely. And I think you have to take this into consideration. Um, elevation is critical. And, and Rachel mentioned that earlier about living at 9,000 feet. Um, but in IMO collection, um, you never want to collect more than a thousand feet above your present uh, um, uh, <laughs> spit it out elevation. Um, and that's where that's where you're growing. So if say I'm growing at one thousand feet, the most I want to do my IMO collection is at two thousand feet. Do I want to go to sea level? No, because you're spot on, Brian. The organisms, for whatever reason, as the elevation gets higher and higher, they get hardier and hardier. So they're going to actually do better in, in your environment. Um, kind of think of it this way, right? And I talk about in vivo versus in vitro. Anytime you're dealing with uh, soil uh, biological amendments, you have two choices. You have in vivo, which is in a laboratory, or you have in vivo, which would be IMO. That's in nature. So when you collect an organism out of nature, it's going to be like collecting the, the, the person out of a very harsh living condition. So like a, a ghetto. So you take the, the little rich kid who's had a silver spoon in his mouth since he was born, never had to work, never had to think, never had to do anything. And you throw him in the ghetto, how well is he going to do? But vice versa, you take the kid out of the ghetto and you throw him into a mansion with all of these resources. How well is he going to do, right? So it's the same ideas. The you're collecting out of nature because they are more suitable to survive than some something that was grown in a lab with no enemies, perfect food, perfect life, no no stress. Um, so I refer to those as biostimulants versus bioinoculants. I hope that helps. Absolutely, man. 
So, Brian, there's a question for you. Duke Seeds, Duke Diamond. Okay, so um, I spoke with Duke Diamond about a week ago um, about his current situation, and so I reached out to Peter and the rest of the group here. Uh, we're going to raise money for Duke Diamond. Um, you know, behind the scenes, we're still putting some things together, uh, but our goal is to have him call in or at least record something for us at the time um, schedule doesn't work. Uh, but we do want to have um, – Give him a voice, if you will, um, hopefully in like uh, not this next Thursday for Thanksgiving, but the, the uh, Thursday after that. And, and to correct some misinformation or uh, to correct a lot of ru ru rumor rumors that are that have been swarming and going around. Yeah. And for the for the major one that I've heard a lot of people say, uh, Duke will be out next year. So if he if he did some of the things that a lot of you guys are claiming out there, then um Obviously, he wouldn't be getting out in uh, six months or less. So I would like to leave it at that and then let Duke, you know, kind of talk about uh, some of the things that he wants to talk about in his own words and then just kind of piggyback on that. Free Duke. So it's uh, nice. one it's one ten in the p.m. in California. You guys want to wrap it up with that or do you want to? What are your thoughts? I got a key. Yeah, fine with that. <laughs> yeah, this is three hours is good. I feel like I've been, I've been holding it in. Form. Uh, likewise. Uh, so, and I, so, I, just, I wish we go ahead. I was gonna say I wish we had more more time to, to talk because uh, Rachel, we could have gone down that spiritual rabbit hole, but my, my phone was glitchy and it just got all weird and I I couldn't communicate. But well, hopefully we'll get a chance to do this again in the future for sure. So so just quickly, uh, I had some notes. Um, so tonight uh, we have a hash conversation with Russ, Kaya, Paul. Uh, solventless is more. Uh, I'm trying to convince um, um, blank Brandon uh, from Third Gen fans oh. to jump on, and and then we have a. Uh, uh, get, if he's watching, Pedro, our our uh, home grower slash home medicine hash maker for him and his family. Uh, then we have a Canyon Water conversation tomorrow afternoon with Eric Brandstadt leading the charge, uh, just talking about because he's been doing some testing within cannabis and other stuff. Um, we're going to be doing a garden tour tomorrow morning. So uh, that's my morning poo coffee or morning in, in sequential order, morning coffee, poo, and then the garden tour. Um, and then Tuesday night, meaning a couple nights ago, uh, we raised, uh, I'm still tallying it up, but I think about $15,000 for fire relief. So thank you, everyone. Uh, Tara is excited for the hash conversation. Um, and uh, so that's kind of awesome, and we're just building momentum. Uh, so the next one, hey, go ahead. I heard that ESPN created ESPN2. <laughs> yeah, well, no, so we have FCP2, uh, which I put in the, uh, in the uh, a link to it. Just people start following it. You'll see what it's all about shortly, but... Uh, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, there are a lot of moving parts, but the vision is, is, uh, I think everybody will like the vision. And, oh, and by the way, today's, uh, our, the, the house band for the show, uh, apologizes, but he's on vacation right now. Oh, That's, uh, oh, Benny, Benny from Tel Aviv, uh, <laughs> playing his new Orleans jazz, uh, Dr. John style, but, uh, he <laughs> promised next time, um, Basically, he's going to be doing some original song. Oh, so uh, tonight's musical guest is um, Josh Heinrichs, um, who is awesome and rocks. So we're going to have some music tonight, but just not today. And then, uh, so by the way, next Thursday is Thanksgiving. I propose we take a break for a week. You guys down with that? Yeah, that's okay. second. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. D Family first. 
Uh, unless everybody wants us competing with uh, Thanksgiving football, and and we'll do <laughs> back. I think they're back to back Thanksgiving games, right? Uh, typically on Thanksgiving. So don't they do three now? I don't know, but uh, I would like to chill out and watch some football and mindlessly, uh, yeah, hang out, uh, hash people. That's a a nice uh, ending comment. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. It was really great to meet you. I love your story, and, and I look forward to having uh, further conversations with you, for sure. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's just been such an honor to be a part of this community and learn and share from you all. Um, and I do want to mention you had talked about the Fire Relief Fund, so I donated a private Gunjasana class for that fund, so I hope someone awesome wins it and you'll get to join me in my living room and we'll work one-on-one -on -one personally and raise lots of money for the fire relief fund. Um, <clears throat> and then for the winter solstice coming up this December, I'll be doing a live Ganjasana ceremony. We'll work with the plant spirit medicine and that will be for everybody. So I hope everyone can um, come attend and learn. And it's just been awesome to connect with you all today. Yeah, those three right. hours flew by. And then I got to start my work day. <laughs> <laughs> right? <So. laughs> yeah, I loved all the Zaza, the inside jokes from everybody who is still around late uh, Tuesday night. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, thank you, everyone. And uh, I'll see some of you tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Rachel. Much appreciated. And with that, I so will kill the live.